people aren't I'm not. I'm right. I'm going to be live. <laughs> It's cool. I love it. All right, good morning. I want to welcome all of you to our Whatever Happened to Marriage seminar. Um, for those of you who do not know me, we have several guests this morning. I welcome you. I'm so glad you could be here with us. And I really hope this will be a, a helpful time, just in terms of, of talking about marriage, you know, what's going on with it. And as we go through this, it's not going to be anything, hopefully nothing new necessarily for you, but really questioning, are we doing what we're called to do as Christians within our marriage? That's kind of like the overarching theme, especially the second part of this. Um, but as it is, welcome. My name is Pastor Joe Griffo. I'm pastor here at Redeemer Church of South Hills, and it is a blessing uh, to have you. Uh, just real quick word on the schedule, what we're going to be doing. Um, if you look on your outlines, the first couple of... Uh, number one and number two, those parts are going to take about half hour, 45 minutes. If you're part of our congregation, you know this is review. We just finished up a series on the creation ordinances. We talked about marriage for a couple weeks. Um, it had a couple messages regarding that. But here's what um, I want to do is get, get this down to lay our foundation. Now, here's what the deal is. Here's what, the, here's what issues we're dealing with that are clouding marriage, mixing it up. Here's what scripture absolutely teaches about foundational to marriage. And then after that, we'll take a break, 10 minutes, we'll get our coffee, get a fruit snack, then we'll come back and we'll deal with section three. That's the big section. That's okay. So what do we, what do, we do as Christians within our marriage? How are, we supposed to, who, how are we supposed to be the spouses that we're called to be within marriage? After that section, we'll have lunch. And following lunch, Luke will come up and he will speak to singleness uh, and, and the Christian life, which is really good. Please hang out for that. Um, if you're single, absolutely. But you have family, you have friends, you have children. This, this information will be good for them, especially in the climate that we're living in today, no doubt. So let me open with a word of prayer and we'll get right into it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much. And we come before you, Lord God, and we ask your blessing upon this time. And I just pray, Lord, that this institution that you have ordained for our good and for your glory, Lord, would, would speak deeply to our hearts, that we would take serious your word, not get caught up in the culture and what's going on around us, and not, well, not where the world, the flesh, and the devil take us, Lord, our own hearts, but that we look to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we seek to honor this precious institution that you have given to us, Lord. 
So we ask your blessing upon this time. Would you give us ears to hear you, Lord, and, and hearts, Lord, to receive and to act upon that which you've given to us. And I pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. All right, we'll jump right into it. Let's talk about the current state of marriage. It's, you know, if you're aware at all of what's going on in culture, that the, the current state of marriage has fallen on pretty tough times, right? You know, as Christians, it's tough. It's tough to, to even think about what we're up against as, as believers in Christ. We, we really feel many ways like outcasts when it, when it comes to, to the whole marriage thing, this day and age, if you think about that. And I'm, I'm not here trying to set up a straw man. There are a lot of very strong marriages. I'm not saying it's the end of marriage as, as we know it. But I'm telling you, we're, it has fallen on some tough, tough, tough times especially biblical marriage. That's what I'm, not simply traditional, but biblical marriage. It's an institution that used to be held in honor and revered, not so much today. Several factors to that, right? Let's just, let's just start off. You can look at your outlines. Current state of marriage, number one. There, there are men, many more than the three I'm going to mention, but I'm just going to list these three. These have really impacted the state of marriage, haven't they, when we think about it. Overall, number one, Divorce, the D word. I know that's tough. It's, it's, it's even difficult to say because I think if I took a poll, I'm not going to do that, but if I took a poll, I, I bet almost everyone, if not everyone in this room, has been touched by divorce in one way or another, right? Either you are divorced, have been divorced, or uh, your children, family member, friends. We know that. It's, it just permeates society. It's just part of, of our society today. But it's really not good but I think in some ways, because of these things, because it's touched us, because we've been involved in it in one way to another, it's almost normalized. It's almost a normal thing. If you grew up like me, um, late 60s through the 70s, it, it wasn't normal, right? It wasn't. People were divorced, obviously, but not like it is today where it's just accepted. If you're, I don't know, 35 years and younger, it's just part of your culture. And it's, just, it's just part of what happens you know somebody who's divorced, you may be divorced yourself. So it, I think because we have been impacted so much, we almost kind of downplay it. But it's not good. It's not good. It, it hurts the institution of marriage. You know, between 42 and 45% of marriages end in divorce. It's just way too easy to leave. Now, sometimes it's necessary. There's no doubt, and we, we understand that, and Scripture teaches, and instances of adultery, uh, abandonment by an unbelieving spouse, it's there. Sometimes it is necessary. But if we're honest, it's way too easy, right? And it has had an impact on our marriages, and our marriage, uh, generally speaking. Let's face it, most cases, it's devastating. If you've been part of it, you understand. It hurts the spouse those involved directly. It hurts the children, children of divorce, even adult children. You know, sometimes people wait and they're older along, uh, go along in their marriage and they just decide they're 60, 65, just it's kind of over. The adult children feel it too, right? It still makes that, it has such an impact, a hurtful impact. Extended family, people, it affects us emotionally, psychologically, physically, financially, spiritually. The effects are felt. For years. So I don't want to downplay divorce and just the impact that that's had on, on our marriages and on our families, no doubt. Divorce, and, and the reason is this, and we just need to be aware. I know this isn't new for you, but I just want you to start thinking about this because we want our marriages to be strong as Christians. We need to. Right? Divorce is the opposite of God's intention for marriage, isn't it? That's what it is. God wants to bring us together. What God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. Right? That's what divorce does. It tears apart. It hurts us. It breaks apart. And you lose permanence. You lose stability. You lose security, right? You lose order, structure, just that feeling of safety. You know, when, when things are good and there's, and there's a stable family, there's a safety there. That, that's gone. The, that, it takes that away, doesn't it? And I know this stings a lot of, it stings all of us because like, I, I I almost bet, I don't want to take a poll, I'm tempted to take a poll, but I wouldn't be surprised if each and every one of us here has been affected by it uh, to one degree or another. 
it undermines, divorce undermines the entire institution that God himself ordained for his glory and for our good. That's what it does. Let's just be real about it. I know it's hard to talk about, especially if you're affected with it directly, just because of the pain that it causes. But there's redemption in Christ, and that's always going to be our hope. That's the hope that we have. Second thing, another big deal is, is cohabitation. Um, why even get married? And, and, and some of, some of co the idea of living together is, comes from those who have lived through divorce. I don't want to go through that. It's just easier to shack up. It's just easier. It's the pragmatic alternative to marriage. Why go through the hassle and the expense of being married, right? Why not just live together? And people are doing that in larger and larger numbers, absolutely, for sure. That's like the trend right now is, is kind of living together. Because then, you know what, if it doesn't work out, no messy divorce, you know, things that you can just kind of go your way. Now, we know there's still an emotional tool. It doesn't matter a tool to be paid for that. But in different ways, hey, you know, if, if things don't work out, we could just go our separate ways. So, so cohabitate, definitely on the rise. Not too long ago, this was considered wrong by most people. You know that for sure. Um, but 2016, 18 million couples, according to the Census Bureau, are living together, cohabitating. And that's nearly a 30% increase since 2007. Younger generation, millennials, you guys, you're just, you're shacking up in droves. You're just living together. It's not limited to, to the younger, but especially that demographic. And the one that does, though, it, it casts, and here's the spiritual payoff. Here's where it comes back to what we're thinking about. It, it, has, it shows a suspicion or an apathy towards marriage, doesn't it? If you're, I don't need to get married. Why even, why even go through that? directly but indirectly that's apathy towards God himself why because marriage is a God-ordained institution that's exactly what it is so cohabitation doesn't acknowledge if you're shacking up if you're living together it doesn't acknowledge God ordained institution of marriage as being necessary I don't need to be married right I don't need God in my life. And so that's just an indication we're getting farther and farther away from the Lord. It shows little of any, any regard for God, right? Obviously, if you're living together, there's no issue with sex and children before marriage. So marriage, God gave it. Part of the context of marriage is sex and family within that context. So when you're saying when you're cohabitating, I don't really need that. It might be pragmatic reasons, but what you're really saying is, God, I don't need that institution. I'm, I'm just fine without you. We could do it without you. It's basically what we're saying. It's had a devastating effect, man. Just, it just has on marriage, on relationships, and families. And it continues to do that. See, this is kind of what we're up against as Christians. So how, what, what do we do? That's going to be the bulk of what we talk about as we move forward. Number three, um, well, one more point on the, on the cohabitation. Um, besides a no issue with having sex outside of marriage and children and so forth, there's an idea of self-sufficiency. Again, no vows are required, nothing beyond or bigger than yourself. Again, thank you very much, God, but I could do this on my own. That's what we're saying in that regard. Number three, or C on your outline, it's being redefined. Again, this is coming fast and furious upon us as, as Christians. It's affecting marriage, the whole institution that God has ordained. And you can see we get farther and farther away from the Lord, right? This is what the Lord has. This is the institution. Divorce breaks that apart. Cohabitation, a little farther away. And now it's being redefined to what is marriage? What is marriage? And it's ironic because... The folks that are cohabitating, they really don't want anything to do with marriage. But now, where there's a redefinition of marriage, they want to be married. But they want to do it their way. And that's really important. You know what? That, that's just a complete reversal of what God has ordained and given to us. So you're getting married to suit your own ideals, your own inclinations, your own feelings, and your own desires. So, so it's very subjective. It's not objective. Here's God. This is what I've given to you. Here's what you have. We're saying, no, no, no. Not at all. Here's what I think marriage needs to be, God. It's not just I'm not getting married, okay, I'm putting you over there. God, I'm telling you, here's what marriage looks like for me, right? And that's, that's what we have. We want it to be what we think it should be, not what God meant it to be 
So what are you doing there, man? Right away, you're putting man above God. You're not just putting God to the side. Man is now taking the seat. I will ascend to the hill of the Lord. That's really what this is. So it's not based on objective truth that we have in the word, but it's very subjective. So it's based on our feelings. So you can get married for any reason you want to, basically to anyone, and I'm telling you, you might laugh when I say this, but anything that you want to coming in the future. I'm, I say that a little tongue-in-cheek, but don't be surprised. You know, like things are happening in different areas. where, And what's to stop anything from going this far? Who thought we would be this far when it comes to marriage and, and who we're called to, to be with? So same-sex, quote, marriage, and I put the quotes around it, is a direct attack on the institution of God. You know what it is? It's a complete reversal of God. If you wrestled, and I wrestled in high school, and it was a great move. If somebody had you in a different in a position and you were able to, to reverse that, you would end up on top and have the advantage. That's exactly what this is. This is a reversal of God's intention for marriage itself. So there's no doubt that biblical marriage is under attack. There's, there's, in that way, you know, we're dealing with this as Christians and as the church. The problem is, and here it is, guys, this is an issue for us, and I, and I, wanna, I want this to be very clear. To this point, I've been talking outside the church. The problem is, is that more and more, the church and Christians are ending up mirroring the culture. So instead of our marriages being strong and a light in a very dark place and, and persevering through this, more often than not, we kind of almost end up doing what the culture does, right? Not all the time, but very often. So think about it. Divorce, it's not as high as the national level, for sure. And I'm talking about professing Christians. I'm not just saying, yeah, I was divorced, now I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian now, and I'm married. Not that. I'm talking about two people who profess Christ, who love Jesus Christ, say they love Christ in their hearts, get married, and five, eight, ten years later, they're divorced. That's what I'm talking about here. That is on the rise. Now, it's not as high as the national average. But it is somewhere, if I'm remembering correctly, in the 30 percentile, 30, 35 percent. Oh, that's not too much. It is too much. If we're Christians, that's, that's, too, that's unacceptable for Christian marriages to be divorced. But we kind of mirror the culture even in these ways. Cohabitations, again, more and more professing Christians, they're just shacking up. They're just living together. A lot of the younger group that's doing and say, hey, we're going to get married in two years anyway. We're going to get married in a year, so we're just buying our house now. We're just preparing, and we're sleeping. But hey, we're going to get married anyway. We go to church together, and we do this together. Wait a minute. That's, that's, that would be unacceptable for the Lord, even for us, 10 or 15 years ago. And yet you see more and more professing Christians saying, hey, let's just live together, even if it's temporary, even if we're working towards marriage. Right? How do we handle that as Christians? How about same sex? You go to liberal church, you might say, oh, well, the liberal churches, of course, they'll do that. I mean, you go to Shady Side, you can see churches on different corners with the rainbow flag, and everyone's welcome here, and we'll do anything you want. We kind of expect that. We know that there are liberal churches that, that, expect, that accept that and, and perform those marriages. But I'm here to tell you this morning that even. E and evangelical churches, this is becoming more and more, and I wouldn't say accepted per se, but we're thinking about it, right? How many of you have heard the, the name Matthew Vines? No? Okay, you need to write that name down. Matthew Vines, he's a young man. He's an articulate, he's smart, he's knowledgeable of scripture, he knows the word of God. He knows doctrine in, in many ways. We're a reformed church. He's reformed, but he's a homosexual. And he is promoting, and this is catching on, the lar large, a significant portion of evangelicals that homosexual marriage is okay for Christians so long as it's monogamous. That's the idea. Okay, You have two, uh, a, a loving couple that's, true to each other, that, that stay in that, in that monogamous relationship, 
As long as that's the case, that's okay. But we say, well, what about all the scriptures that speak against that? Well, there's six big passages. Matthew Vines will take you to those passages, and he'll explain them. Now, of course, we don't agree with his explanation, but he'll say, look, this was man-boy relationship. This was temple. That was that. It wasn't two loving men or two loving women together. Okay? Again, I'm just, this is what I'm saying. It's, we're up against this, even as, as Christians. These things are coming in terms. So what do we need to do about it? That's, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. So the, the idea is, wow, man, is there any hope for recovering and maintaining biblical marriage? I'd say, yes, there is. <laughs> Obviously, it might not seem like it after that, but there is. That's the purpose of, of this seminar, is to keep our marriages strong and to honor the institution. That's what I want us to do. What I'm going to tell you this morning, this isn't, this isn't going to be like a typical seminar necessarily where you have a bunch of principles or strategies or steps on how to improve your marriage. I'm going to be telling you things that you guys, if you're Christians, you already know for the most part. The big challenge for you this morning is are you doing that which you know to be true? Are you leaning into Jesus Christ? Is your focus upon him? I know this is going to it sound simplistic, but please bear with us and, and hang out because... I, I want us as Christians to be challenged to live for Christ. And that's going to, we're going to talk about that in our third session, the third part of this. What I want to do right now is just lay the biblical foundation. So we're talking about, okay, this is how marriage is being redefined. This is how it's coming under attack over here. This is what people are doing marriage over there. What do we believe as Christians about marriage? And I want to lay the biblical foundation for that. This is, this is why we believe what we believe in regards to marriage. So when people talk to you about it, your friends, your neighbors, yeah, what makes you so different? Why do you believe this? Well, here's why, and here are the reasons why. Now, they might not buy it. That, you know, that's, that's up to the Lord. But we need to know the foundation of marriage and what it's about. So we're going to spend a few moments doing that. For those in my congregation, uh, you know this all too well because I just preached on it a few weeks ago. So I'm not going to go in depth. And if you haven't, um, if you weren't there for the messages, you can look us up. We do have our messages online. It's under creation ordinances, and there's a couple sermons on marriage. What I want to do is just go back and um, lay the foundation very quickly for us. So under number two, the biblical nature of marriage, just the basics. Number one, it is a divine or the divine origin. So if you do have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1. 26, 27, very familiar passages for us, but here it is. And this is why we call it a creation ordinance, because when, did, when was it instituted? When did it come about? How did we get it? At creation by God. Boom, that's it. That's, that means that it applies to all people at all times everywhere. Okay? This, is, this is for uh, God's creation. So Genesis chapter 1. And beginning in 26 and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and, fem male and female, he created them. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air of the heavens, and over every li living thing that moves on the earth. And then chapter 2, if you want to turn over to 2, beginning 20, verse uh, 20 through 25. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up the place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into woman. He brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. They shall hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, those are the, the creation ordinance, creation of male and female. This is the divine or, origin of marriage. This is why we as Christians say, yes, this is where marriage comes from. This is what it is. 
It's ordained and instituted by God, your creator. So he has the final word on it, right? He's the one who made us. He has the prerogative and the right to do what he will do. And we're called to follow him and to obey him. So this is where it's ordained and instituted. It's not, marriage is not a man-made construct. That's another thing you'll get. Well, societies came up with it. This is why we do that. We could do it this way and that way. It's not. It's not man-made that's subject to change or modification or personal preferences or cultural trends. Now, people in different places, there's a basic idea of marriage in every society and every culture that you go to. There is a basic idea of marriage. That's the creation ordinance. Now, because of our fallenness and sin, what do people do with it? We take it, we twist it, we turn it upside down, we do what we will, what we will with it. But know this, marriage is a creation ordinance by God. He has the right, the prerogative, to say what, what it consists of, and we're called to obey that. Now, in our sinfulness, we don't. Understood? That's a big deal. That's a big thing. The Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. And you know this. You know this. Nobody wants to be alone. Okay, there might be some people like who want to go live in the mountains by themselves, but I don't know. Not, And that's probably, that's because of our fallen nature, even there. But really, you know this. You don't like to be alone. You want a companion. You want somebody to, to share your life with and, and time with and to be with. So in some capacity, in some, you want that. Nobody likes to be alone. For Adam, there was not found a suitable helper. Just before I started reading, you know what Adam was doing? He was naming all the animals. He was seeing if there was anything suitable for him in creation to be a companion, to be that helpmate, to be the person he needed. And there was not one. Animals cannot fulfill that need. Now, I'm a cat lover. And so is my family. <laughs> and they come close, <laughs> but they can't do. They don't give us exactly what we need, right? I mean, there's companions with pets, but it doesn't match what the Lord has made for us. We need a suitable helper, right? In, in, in his image. And so there are wonderful similarities between man and woman, to be sure. Again, I'm just giving you the Cliff's Notes version of my, of my message. You can go back and get the details on this. He gives us that there's, there's that likeness that we have and that image that we bear as God's creation, as, as being created by God. But there's also important differences. It's not exact sameness. Let's just keep that in mind. It's complementary. We complement one another perfectly in every way. We compensate for each other. We complete each other. That's God's intention in regards to male and female companionship and marriage. And check it out. God fashion the woman that's so intimate that's a beautiful beautiful detail don't miss that i don't want you to miss that because it's it's very intentional that the writer puts it that god caused sleep to come upon the man takes the rib and he fashions it's personal it's it's intimate this is what god is doing he took her out of the man but since then man has come from the woman you know, man and woman have come. So you see that complementary view. You see that equality. You see that beauty there that the Lord brings, brings forth in that way. And then what's the Lord do? He presents her. He presents her to the man. He said, here, she's for you, and you are for her. Right? And what's that remind you of? It's, it's, a, it's a wedding. It's a beautiful one. When the father comes and brings his beautiful daughter down the aisle, I'm about to cry as I look at my daughter, and he gives her away. And it's a picture of this. This is for you. It's special. Okay. And there's that tenderness that, that comes from that. And that's really the, the first marriage, if you want to want to put it that way. So that's a beautiful thing. So we're laying the foundation. This is why as Christians, we need to hang tough here. Because we're being challenged all over the place. But when it comes to marriage, same thing. Why do you believe in marriage? Where does it come from? How can you say that? This is how. This is why. Now, people might not buy it or believe it, but now you have you could tell them why, and you have good reasons for them. It's up to the Lord to change their hearts. But we need to know why and give that answer forth. And we see things comport in this way, where there is solid marriages. You have wonderful, uh, better families. Not perfect because we live in a fallen world, but you know what it's like to live in a Christian home where parents love the Lord and love their children. Again, not perfect by any stretch, but there's, there's that that closeness there, that love there, that order, that structure, that companionship, everything that we long for, that we need, more, more or less. Again, I'm not trying to paint a perfect picture of the Christian family. Ain't no such thing. 
<laughs> if you think that, come and live at our house for a week and you'll see that. But uh, we have this here coming, coming forth. Uh, then we have the threefold foundation. This could be a whole seminar in itself. We're not going to do that. We're, not, we're going a little bit different direction today. It's going to be uh, different than this. But what I'm about to talk to you right here could be the foundation for a really good seminar. And we could really elaborate on these things. But it's a threefold foundation of uh, biblical marriage, of a, of a Christian marriage, what it's meant to be. And again, there's that number three. That's a biblical number. You know, you think of the Trinity. Think of the threes in Scripture, how that is. So what's the threefold foundation? Very quickly, number one, leave. This is, the, this is the essence of a strong marriage, that you need to leave. That means, that word literally means to come out from under the authority of, right? So you need to leave something. You need to leave someone if you're going to have a strong marriage. Who do you need to leave? Your mother and your father. Now, that sounds harsh in a way, but that's what he means. It means that you love, honor, respect your parents in every single way because the rest of scripture teaches that to honor your father and your mother to to listen to them to cherish them as as you would respect them but your spouse must be your priority and this hurts a lot of marriages where this isn't the case you, know, you have a mama's boy and he's just going to do whatever his mommy wants him to do and his wife's just kind of over here well we need to please mommy because she's going to get mad it's all, it always comes back to the mothers, <laughs> right? And so, and so that, that damages the marriage. When you have um, a, a woman who just can't leave her family, just, you know, and everything's around her family, and they're over the marriage. So what this means, and the Lord knows what he's doing when he says, you need to leave. You need to leave your mother and your father. And then number two, second foundation, is you need to cleave. And that's a really cool word in Hebrew. It means to hold on tightly, just, you know, sticking to. Again, we, we have little kittens right now. I'm going to use my cat illustrations, yeah. And, and when you, you grab the little ones and you put them here, and, you just, and they, just, they just cling to you. They, they put their claws into your shirt. And you're just like, okay, okay, it's time to get off now. And, you know, you have to shake, shake them off. But that's the idea that you're, that you're clinging to. And there's an emphasis on permanence, Right. We want that, to know that, the, that I'm not going anywhere. I am here for you always till death do us part, right? We want that sense of permanence, of devotion, of dedication, of determination. I'm determined to make this work. I'm, I'm staying so you're so you're cleaving. You're not taking off. You're not leaving like so many are apt to do today. I'm, I'm out of here at a drop of a hat. Man, I just this isn't the person I married. I'm gone. I want something more. No, that, that's the opposite of, of cleaving. The idea behind this and underneath this you need to know is, are the ideas of loyalty. Right? Don't you love it when somebody's loyal to you, that they're, they're faithful to you, and it's active, it's ongoing. And again, this provides what we all want, stability, right? security, confidence, companionship. That the Lord, he gave us this. So you leave and you cleave. And then number three, one flesh. Leave, cleave, the two shall become one flesh. And this, it's related to, to, to cleaving for sure, but it, but it has, a, has a little nuance to it, different nuance, and it speaks to intimacy too. See, all these things are foundational to, to a biblical marriage. This is what we want in our marriages, right? Because this speaks to intimacy, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and it's that, again, what everybody wants, a deep expression of love, that I love you, that I'm here for you, and I'm expressing that in this way, right? Those, those, those things we do, those, those intimate times, pursuing, um, romancing, loving in that way. So that one flesh speaks to that closeness. On another level, it speaks to that deep oneness that you're one in purpose and one in priorities as Christians. That's the best thing. You know, it's, opposites might attract, but after a while, man, that gets old and that gets really hard and that, that, that sends us apart. But as Christians, there's that, there ought to be that oneness, that one mind, that one purpose. There's going to be differences, of course. I romanticize all this. I know. <laughs> We're still falling. And, but that's the hope, that, that there's one mind and our priorities are the same and our purpose is the same, right? So I'm laying the foundation here. 
How long have I gone? <laughs> Got a couple more points to hit on this. So we're just laying this foundation. The parties who are to get married, listen, they're determined by God. You've got to stick to this. You've got to be tough. As Christians, he has the prerogative. He has the right. He's the creator. He says what goes, and we're called to obey him. And when we don't, there will be consequences sooner or later for sure. The parties, they're determined by God. What's he say? In marriage, one man, one woman. Right? This is just real basic. <laughs> but in today's world, you say this. Go ahead. Go say this. Go on the street. I feel safe in here. We're in our church. We're Christians. But go, you know, go downtown and talk about these things. Go on a college campus and talk about these things. Say what I'm saying right now and see what happens. Okay? One man, one woman. Heterosexual, not same, not bi, not trans. That's it. He sets it. He gives the parties. Monogamous, okay. one, one spouse, not few, not sister wives, not, not, not going over here, not doing that. We could talk about polygamy in the Bible. That's not part of this. If you want to talk to me about that, we could do that. We're not going to go here, and it's not part of the seminar. It's not in the scope of this seminar. But it's meant to be monogamous. We see that here. It's the foundation from Scripture. Jesus says the same thing. He reiter reiterates it in Matthew's Gospel. And also know that Adam or Eve could not fulfill the creation or the cultural mandate, be fruitful and multiply. Go subdue the earth. Couldn't do this alone. They needed each other, obviously. And Adam couldn't do it with the animals. Again, like I mentioned before, all the animals came. There wasn't a suitable helper for him. Can't relate in the same way. Can't do what God commanded you to do to subdue apart from one created in the image of God, right? Or with one exactly like him, right? There has to be, there's essential qualities of sameness, but there's also differences, important differences. It's all part of God's plan, right? He determines this. So we're laying the foundation. Last thing, number D, or letter D. Number four, or letter D. <laughs> God's purposes for marriage. Intimate, multidimensional, or complex companionship. That's the idea here. What do I mean by that? It means there's different vocations within marriage. There's different roles and functions. We'll talk about that in our next session. But that's the idea here. It's, it's, it's on so many different levels that our relationship hinges on even verbal, that we could talk to one another. Again, if you want to get a pet, you could talk to your pet and make your pet talk to you, right? You use your pet voice on the pet, but it's not going to be the same thing. You know, you're not going to have that kind of communication that you could have with another person when creating our image. Emotional, physical, all those different layers, all those different levels. God has created his purpose for, for us, that he's given us marriage in that way, that it's multi, it's complex companionship. That's how we fulfill. That's how we complete that's how we complement one another. Secondly is procreation, the propagation of the human race. Be fruitful, multiply, have families, get married, have babies. That's what the Lord is saying. Let's do that. That's, that's part of our, our um, command to uh, dominion, creation command there. To have a heritage, to leave a legacy, to have that, that family. That's, that's part of God's purpose and plan for marriage. And we know that not everybody can or, or does have children. It doesn't mean you're not a family if you, if you don't or you can't, but that's part of what the Lord has for us. And then the exercise of dominion, that is subduing the earth. When we do that to his glory, we bring order, structure, security, foundation for a stable society, all for his glory. That's the idea. As we consider, listen, everything we do is for the glory of God including marriage. So if you're a Christian today and you think about what God has created, some days you just go out, you get your cup of coffee, you have your Bible, your devotional, right? You go out to your back porch and you're just hanging out and you're reading and you're looking around and you're just praising God. You're like the psalmist, you know, looking around. Oh, Lord, look at all this that you've made, how wonderful this is. It just speaks to your glory, to your goodness, to, to your grace, we don't deserve this. When I see all the things that you've, what is man so frail and weak that you should consider him, right? As David says. We see that. We just, we, we praise him 
for the general revelation for, for, for his creation. It's the same thing when we come to marriage. This is what he has given. When we think about marriage, we should be moved to give him thanks. Now, I know some of us in our marriages, that's the last thing we want to be doing. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for this. Are you kidding me? Really, we need to be giving him thanks for perfectly providing all that we need to meet our deepest needs. So so don't overlook that. Think about that. That he gave us this institution for his glory, yes, but especially for our good because God is a giver, because God loves us, because God, in that sense, wants us to have the best. Here it is. Here's what I've done for you. What are you going to do with it? So that's it. That's the, 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 the foundation for marriage. Um, we're good now. I, I want to just get that out there from the introduction. We're going to take a break, take about 10 minutes. You can fill your coffee up. We have some fruit back there, and then we come back, and we're going to hit number three. That's going to be the main portion of my presentation um, as we talk about our expectations for marriage. So let's take a 10-minute break or so, and then we'll resume.
I've found in the Bible and then what I've found to be true in experience uh, is that um, the Lord did create us to have these roles and the Lord has created uh, the husband to lead and to lead by serving his wife like Christ loved and served the church and that he laid down his life for her and that um, like the church, we are to um, flourish under Christ's leadership and our husband's leadership. Now, Matt, as awesome as he is, he is not Jesus, but... It's true, no arguments. But, uh, so it means, so he, he is, he has flesh and sin that he's still struggling against. And, um, but um, there is something freeing to know that how Matt loves and serves me is by wanting to hear what I have to say about something. He will, you know, um, I can give an example. Not too long ago, I felt like I was, we were supposed to kind of take this journey towards this home that had some land because our daughter had, uh, she had a horse and um, horse things were becoming really big in our lives. And I had a vision for how we could use it ministry-wise with uh, people outside of our family and um, felt like the Lord say to me, hey, I want you to just go down this path. Let's, let's see what I have for you in looking at this house, considering it. And I, I took it to Matt and I was like, what do you think? And he said, you know what, let's just, we'll go down this path and we'll see what the Lord says. And uh, we'll see if there are any red flags, if this isn't working. And so I just entrusted that to him. And, you know, we'd, I would talk to him about this is why it would be good and this is why this would be good. And um, we almost got to the point that we were going to purchase um, this home. And just one night, we're, we're working through some things and Matt just doesn't have a piece about it. And I remember being devastated <laughs> in my own heart, partly because I thought, oh, Lord, did I just... Did I hear you wrong? Like, is, do I not hear you, your voice? Do I not recognize it? it was this the wrong thing? Um, and then devastated because I, I had this vision and I was so excited about it. And um, I felt like the Lord say again to me um, that it wasn't a, a loss, that he had something in that whole journey and trusting him and listening to his voice. But then I also got to uh, trust Matt and his leadership of our family and knowing that this decision that he was making was on his shoulders, not mine, because he is the head of our home and he's the head of our marriage. And so I get to flourish and have that peace that it's not on me, that that decision, the brunt of that, that decision is on him, that he would have to be responsible for the ramifications of what we, the decision we make. So it's a freeing thing to know that I can come to Matt and say, this is how I feel about this decision, a major decision. Would you at least consider, would you pray? And I trust you with the decision. And so that's an example of how that's, um, of what that looks like in our family and how I've just found the Lord to be faithful in that and, and uh, brought me a lot of peace to sit under um, that leadership. Um, I, have, I have no desire to ever say no to Lauren. Um, and so the way we've tried to operate is I just want to lay my yes down to Lauren and say, I want to say yes to whatever you want, whatever you ask for. Now, there are times when um, saying yes would be unwise and foolish and put us in harm's way. Um, and, and so um, I think that the reason this has worked so well over the years is my yes is down. And, and so if she wants this and we can do it, then I'm going to say yes. I just have no reason to fight her or to try to flex my authority. I just think people are ridiculous who, who do that or they misunderstand what biblical authority is. And, and then it helps, uh, to, to be quite frank, it, it helps that I, I think Lauren is unbelievably intelligent and... Um, sees things well, and her discernment over uh, really our time together is, I just have so much respect for how she sees and senses and how the Lord speaks through her and to her that um, I'm just going to say yes. Okay, so if you want that, yes, we can do it. Let's look at finances. Can we still be generous? Would that be godly? Would that, yes, then my, my yes is down. 
Um, and then, like in the situation that, that she just described, it, it came down to we could do it, but it would affect our ability to be generous to others. It would affect our giving towards missions and our giving towards other people. And so it, it, it was one of those things where, you know, we, not just me, but we said, it, is this a turn we want to make? I mean, do we want to call some missionaries going, hey, your, your support's being cut back. Do we want to not be able to bless people in order to make this move? And, and I, I felt like I don't want to make that move. And she was like, we can't make that move. And so then we made the decision. So even in hearing you say, I made that decision, I, I felt like we made the decision. And I knew it hurt you because I kept apologizing. I kept saying, I'm so sorry, baby, because I wanted, I, I heard her heart. I knew she wanted this. I wanted to give it to her, but it just wasn't, it wasn't going to be wise financially. And it wasn't going to enable us to live like we want to live in open-handed generosity. I want in all integrity, stand in front of the church I pastor and ask them to do the very thing uh, that I'm trying to do, which is live in an open-handed generosity to the kingdom work around us. And, and so that, I, my answer to Lauren is yes, now ask the question. And, and as long as we're not walking into sin and as long as we're not jamming ourselves up in regards to wisdom, I'm always saying yes to Lauren. Pick the music we listen to, pick the movie most of the time that we're going to <laughs> pick. The, I mean, there's, but you have good taste in movies, baby. I'm gonna, just, so I don't, anyway.
presentation and it's under number three recovering biblical marriage so let's let's just dive right into it let's just go for it right now um no doubt you know um if you have any experience at all in, in marriage or christian marriage there have been a countless there have been countless numbers of books that have been written on marriage right you can go to any well they don't have the christian bookstore anymore do they but even barnes and noble we go to different different bookstores or online and there's entire sections dedicated to marriage, how to improve your marriage, um, different strategies for marriage, 10 steps to improve your marriage, five principles to make your married life better, you know, how to strengthen, deepen your marriage, even make your marriage sing, right? There's a one, one book, one study that was coming, learn how to make your marriage sing. It's going to be a little bit different than that this morning. There's no shortage of ministries, for sure, that are specifically focused on marriage and family. Again, these are good things. I'm not, I'm not here at all to degrade these or say, oh, they're, they're awful, they're terrible. I'm not saying that at all. Some are better, better than others, of course. There's no doubt about that. Um, more than a few conferences or seminars like this one, studies on how to improve your marriage. Yeah, man, if you're really honest, despite all of this, all everything... Um, at our disposal, it's available to us. So many Christian marriages experience the same troubles and difficulties. And oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, they mirror non-Christian marriages as well. So we need to do better. We just do. The question is how? That's a good question. <laughs> I wish I could answer that, though. By recovering biblical marriage, that's, that's one thing. What's that mean, recover b biblical marriage? What's that look like? I can't explain it exactly. I wish I could. The big idea is this. Here's the big idea. It's real simple, and yet I think it's profound. I hope it is. The big idea is this, how to recover marriage, is to get you to press in to Jesus Christ more and more. Is that it? That's what I came here for? Good thing I didn't have to pay anything to come to this thing. I knew that. I know that. I know, I know it's about my relationship to Christ first and foremost. But my challenge to you, to us, even though we know this, the question is, how are you doing? Are you doing it? That's, that's going to be, I want you to be thinking about that. That's overarching. Yeah, I'm not going to give you steps necessarily. Though There might be steps or principles you can and you'll gather from this, but you already know, for the most part, if you're a Christian. The question is, are you doing it? Are you submitting to Christ? Are you looking to Him? That's going to be the recurring theme. Everything I'm going to talk to from here to, to the end of the session, we're always going to come back to Christ. It's always going to come back to Jesus. Okay? Are you looking to Him? So what I want to do is just make several observations There'll be challenges, encouragements um, to get you really not only to say, articulate, yes, Christ is sufficient. We know that Christ is sufficient. And we believe that Christ is sufficient. But are we living that in our lives, in our married lives? That's, that exposes us. That's going to be the hard This is the hard part. This is the part you could ask my son Luke I've been praying about and struggling with because... It's going to be challenging. I think most of us here, if not all of us, are going to, at some point, you're going to be kind of squirming. I know I will be. So here we go. <clears throat> first things first, if you look at your outline. First things first, this is the first thing you need to know. Um, you need to recognize that marriage is a gospel issue. What? What are you talking about? I thought the gospel, you go tell people about Christ, that marriage is a gospel issue in this way. Christ has redeemed marriage. What do I mean when I say that? The Christ has redeemed marriage? It means only as Christians can we know what marriage means in its fullest, to its fullest extent, in a fuller way. Now, and listen, it doesn't mean that non-Christians, I know we know people that don't believe in Christ, don't trust in Christ for their salvation, have good, solid, strong marriages. That's, that's not necessarily too hard to find. But what this does mean, when I talk about Christ as redeemed marriage, first things first, it's a gospel issue, is that only in Jesus Christ can you gain a fuller, and not just a fuller, but the fullest appreciation of marriage itself. Why? Because he has ordained it. It comes from him. 
So only as, as, as Christians and in Jesus Christ can we begin to gain a proper, hmm, deep understanding of the nature, purpose, and meaning of marriage itself. So we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. A shared biblical view of marriage is essential. It just is to a strong, vibrant, deep marriage because it flows from the gospel. It flows from our relationship to Jesus Christ. If you've been redeemed in Him, if you're trusting in Him, you're going to come to a better, a deeper, more fuller knowledge of marriage itself. Now, what you do with that is, is what we're you know, talking about here. That's what you need to wrestle with. But that's the only way you can truly know the depth of marriage. Right? That gospel being transformed. Why? Because once you transform, our eyes are open. In, in different areas, different different spheres of life, different all, all different places. But when it comes to marriage, we get a mutual understanding of God's intention for marriage design. You have non-Christian friends, and they, their marriage might be okay, but deep down, they don't they don't they're not acknowledging God as the source, and not seeing it through the lens of Scripture. We have that advantage, don't we? We have that gift. We have that opportunity, anyway. What we do with it, again, is what we do with it, right? What are we doing with it? But that's how we know God's intention through the gospel, his expectations for marriage. What kind of husband do I need to be? What kind of wife ought I be? That comes through understanding. It's not subjective. It's not just kind of vague or, you know, I want to try to be this. It's very specific in Scripture. Here's who I'm called to be, right? The most important thing you could be is a strong Christian who loves Jesus Christ, a follower of him. Because everything flows from that. You understand? This is what I, meant, what I mean when I say God has redeemed it. Because it finds its fullness in Jesus Christ. And we can only know that if we're in him. Capisce? Does that make sense? Understand that? This is why we do certain things and don't do other things. Because of our faith in Christ, our understanding, our knowledge. And again, I'm not saying that people that don't believe in Christ don't do things and, and actually do certain things that are right. That's part of God's goodness and common grace. But we as Christians have that inside track. We know what he wants. So when it comes to stuff like divorce, we should, it shouldn't even be in our minds for the most part. Again, I know there's situations where it's acceptable, and, and that's, that's the course we need to you know, the, the, that can be taken, but that's not the first thing on our list. Right? We're not looking for that. That's why we stay in our marriages, even when they're difficult, even when it's hard, because we know God's intention for marriage, and we're honoring Him. We know that He hates divorce. We know the, destruct the damage that it does as Christians. So we, we, it's for, it ought not be on the table for us as Christians in our marriage. Where, in the world, it's just kind of irreconcilable differences. You know, I'm just tired of you. All right. If that was the case, there would be nobody married. Wait, this is, this is part. He's redeemed it. Same thing when it comes to adultery. It's taken. Adultery is very prevalent in many marriages today. People are having affairs left and right. As Christians, it's, it's different. We understand his, his word, his teaching. This is why we flee from temptation. This is why David in Psalm 51, as he repents from his sin and brings it before the Lord, we know that it's sinful. We know the implications of that. Do you understand? He's redeemed it. We have this picture. We have this view of marriage, this understanding. This is why we're to be equally yoked. So the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. What's that mean? You need to be married to a Christian. If you're looking, if you're single now, you can't even consider, you ought not consider one who's not a Christian. Who's not, not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation if you're a Christian. Why? Because you have two different worldviews, man. I don't care how attractive he or she is, how much you love them, and how they make you feel. Because once you get into that relationship, you're going to see the differences when it comes to even things like premarital sex. What do you mean? You're not going to sleep with me. Are you kidding me? We've gone out three times. It's time, right? That's kind of the world's view. I hate to be so crass, but that's basically it. Now, wait a minute. Right? Or, or, or your view of marriage, of children and family, of work. All these things play into that. So we know from Scripture, because Christ has redeemed marriage. So we have that perspective. So we understand those kinds of things. So that's number one. Christ is redeemed. It's a gospel issue. And my question to you is, are you in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in him alone for your salvation? 
And how's that manifesting itself in your marriage? Are you looking to him? That's number one, or A. B, it's a big one. <clears throat> it's a tough one. <laughs> you need to have a clear understanding of what you are bringing into your marriage or what you've brought into your marriage. And that is namely, and here it comes, yourself. You're bringing you into the marriage. Ouch, that hurts. <laughs> and that, that's I don't want the focus to be here. I want you, you need to be keenly aware of this, of what you are bringing into your marriage. Because it's so easy to look at what your spouse is bringing in or what he's brought in or she's brought in. You know, that's, that we want to look elsewhere. We want to look at our circumstances. We want to look at the other person. Listen, a biblical marriage, if we're going to recover it, if it's going to be strong, if we're looking to Christ, you need to consider yourself. Scripture says to examine yourself, to see if you're in the faith. That means, yes, am I truly trusting in Christ, but the implications are far and wide. Am I following Christ? Am I in Christ? Are there fruit in my life in this area, this area, this area? That includes our marriage. Right? The Bible says, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. If we have that approach in our marriages, truly, sincerely, it destroys us in some ways and you know, breaks us down but it strengthens the marriage because it puts the focus on where it needs to be. Because once you examine yourself, you're looking to Christ. This isn't about loving yourself first so you can love your other. No, that's garbage. It's seeing how our own sinfulness, bringing it to Christ that he might forgive and I might be the spouse I need to be for my wife. That's the, that's the idea here, right? Be keenly aware of this. And, and you know what else? It gets, it, it gets tough because... Check this out. Even your best qualities, <laughs> the thing that attracted your spouse to you in the first place, oftentimes become the things that drive you apart, become the things that, 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 that are tiresome, that are difficult in your marriage. That's hard to believe, right? <laughs> I mean, you mean, this is who I am. This is, this is why you liked me in the first place. And now you're telling me what? What happened? See, you need to be aware. We need to be aware of this. We absolutely, your best qualities, the things that make you you and make you cool, are tainted by sin. Understand that. They may have been very attractive, especially at first. Now they weigh on you in the marriage. Let's talk about a few of these. I'm going to give you five or six examples. There are countless different personalities. You're going to fit into one of these. Some of you are strong, bold, and decisive. And that's good. You know, you, especially if you're a, a woman looking for a good Christian man and you want somebody who's bold and who's decisive and who's strong. And that, and that can very well attract you to him. Like, this, he cares. For, he's going to protect me. He's going he's, he's gonna to stand up for me. He's going to be there for me. And that's an attractive quality, isn't it? And it is. And they're wonderful characteristics to, to be bold, to be strong, to take a stand. And I'm here to be decisive. Now, here's what we're going to do. And here's why we're going to do that. And that's, that's something that can be very attractive and very good in many ways. But you know what? When sin gets a hold of those and when sin comes into play there, that person that you were so attracted to, so bold and strong and, you know, just taking care of you in that way can very easily become a domineering person in your marriage, an overbearing person in your marriage, a prideful, stubborn person person and you're a controlling person and yes even sometimes a scary person right do you see that you see what's so your best quality this is kind of defines me in some ways I'm, I'm this i'm strong i'm a leader i do this so at first what your spouse was so attracted to she admired your strength now she's wondering what happened to that person and, and feel smothered and scared do you understand you see that? See, you need to be aware of that. If that's a gift, if that's a strength, if that's a good characteristic that the Lord has given to you, right? Be aware. Because, you know, this is just who I am. But as sin takes hold, all of a sudden, this is who you become. Careful. Careful on that. That's why we need to look to the Lord. Number two, how about a passionate person? Some people, you just love that passionate person. Oh, they, they just have a zeal and a zest for life, and they just go all out with whatever they do. That's cool. That's a good thing. We like passionate people, right? 
you know, you're, you're, you're giving a lot of attention and they just love life and, and they love, love you and, uh, and it's just such a zeal and a zest, but, but taken too far. And when sin comes into play because we're fallen, that same passion becomes an obsession. So that person who has that wonderful passion for this and passion for you becomes very obsessive or very selfish. And guess what? Oftentimes in marriages, you might be their passion and they're pursuing you and have a zeal and a zest for you, but after a while it might be something else. So oftentimes you hear like from a spouse, oh, well, he's married to his job or he's married to his garage. That's his mistress or that's, you know, she loves that. That's who she's really with because now your passion has shifted. So to be passionate is wonderful. It's exciting. It is cool. It's a, it's a wonderful characteristic, but it also becomes, can become. And you need to be aware of that if you're bringing that into marriage. It's part of how um, your personality and who you're made, even in the Lord. That's, where, that's why I say we take the log out of our own eye because we don't like to think that because this is who I am. That's, that's how we think. Another vein, and we talk about uh, being very passionate is when it becomes in an, in an emotional way, when you have that passion, that person can tend to become very jealous, very possessive. You know, first it's passionate, they're loving on me and it's wonderful, but the next thing you know, or down the line, you know, this you're feeling just boxed in. This person's angry and suspicious and what you know, because you're 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 passionate in that way, overbearing. So we need to be careful about that. So even the best things about you because we live in a sinful world, bring damage, can cause damage in the marriage. You understand? So it is about you, but not like loving yourself, but understanding your sinful self and looking to Christ. Another uh, organized, structured person. That's a wonderful thing to be organized, to be structured. A lot of us need that. You know, you need to be guided. You have that. And that's a wonderful, wonderful gift. But if that goes too far in a sinful way, what happens? become very rigid, become demanding, impossible to please. <laughs> Everybody's doing it wrong. My way is the only way. It has to be precise and right every single time. You know, so organized structure is good, but it can get to a place where it becomes, you know, you're, afraid, you're walking on eggshells because you don't want to do something wrong. We need to be careful about that. Okay, is everybody squirming so far? Is there anybody, you get, you're still cool? Okay, how about the easygoing personality? Hey, we'd love that too. That's a wonderful gift. If you're nice and easygoing, you're a relaxed person, a cool person. Everything just kind of sl slips off your back. You go with the flow. That's a, that's a good thing, right? That's, that's, that's not bad, and it isn't bad to, to an extent. But in a sinful way, when that comes to a place where that easygoingness turns into simply being passive, then there's an issue there. Right? How many of you are married to, to a spouse like that? You never confront, you never take a stand, very fearful, little passion for, for anything, and just almost indifferent. You know, that is very frustrating. I hear from uh, spouses all the time, it's, yeah, it's easy, it's easy going, but man, do something, say something, <laughs> you know, get, be, um, you know, take charge once in a while. That, that's, again, but we're not aware of that because these are the best things about us, right? This is what makes me me kind of thing. Um, just one more. I can go on and on. We don't have the time for that. The fun person, right? Again, it's wonderful to have that fun person, that fun-loving, joking kind of, you know, I don't know, tongue-in-cheek, cheeky kind of person. That, that's fun. You, it's fun to be with that person. Everybody, people have that reputation. Just a fun guy or she's a fun gal. It's wonderful to be with them. They're very rarely serious. Again, there's, there's a place for that. But then there does come a time when you need to be serious. Right? That gets, that gets extremely annoying when that fun person, and there's a serious situation, and they're making jokes about it all the time and laughing it off or you know, d diverting the attention elsewhere. There's little emotional depth there. Again, you want to, it becomes annoying. What, what's, it's not funny. Everybody thinks your spouse is so funny except you, right, <laughs> after a while, because, yeah, first you were. I love that about you at first, but man, oh, come on, give me a break. You're not funny anymore. You need to be aware of this. These are good things, and they're so attractive at first, 
But I'm just telling you, this, I'm putting this out there for you in terms of our marriage, how we recapture, because they can and do in sinful ways work against our marriages. And they result in frustration, resentment, disappointment, distance within the marriage. These good things that you bring into the marriage. The trick is this. Be aware, number one, be aware of these dangers in yourself, in yourself especially be, before they become the pattern, become the norm, and it's just kind of the way it is. Also, two attitudes to avoid regarding this. Number one, here's, you must not think this. Don't you think, well, hey, man, this is who I am. This is what you got. This is who you married. Um, deal with it. Right? Avoid that attitude in yourself because that's pride. Hey, I can't change. This is who I am. Avoid that. Consciously avoid that. Number two, the second extreme to avoid is, oh, I'm going to change. I promise I'm going to change. I'm going to work on changing. I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'll do everything I can to change, to change for you. That, 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 that. Don't do that either. That's not what you want to do. But you need to understand this. Christian, you need to understand this, that the Christian life, and here it is, is all about transformation, isn't it? If you're a Christian, you know that. You know that he's transformed you. You know that he's brought you from darkness to light. You're not that person you used to be before Christ. It is all about transformation. It's all about renewal. It's all about change. That's what the Christian life is. Yes. And here it is. You can change, right? You can change. But you can't try it on your own. That's the deal. That's the idea. That's the trick. You can change, but you can't do it on, on your own. You need to rely on the Holy Spirit, on the Lord, to let Him change you with the same transforming power that saved you. And you need to understand that the Holy Spirit is at work in you. So yes, you can change by His power and His strength as you look to Christ. That's the deal. That's the deal. And it's not changing your entire uh, personality, what you bring, those characteristics. That's not it. That's, that's not, like, I'm not that, you know, leader, guiding person. That's, you want to be that loving leader, strong, decisive, that man that she can count on, or that woman who's strong in the marriage and, and, and is there by you. Uh, yes, you want that. you want to avoid the sinful twist on it. I say, you want to use your powers for good, right? <laughs> and that's, that's the idea here. Use what he's given you in a way that glorifies him and is helpful to others. And we do that by looking at Christ. So the idea is your focus doesn't, needs to be on Jesus Christ, right? Be keenly aware of these things in yourself because these are the things we don't want to face about us because this is who we are. This is a good thing about me. This is why you like me in the first place. Wait a minute. Lord, where am I going? So, we can change. How do we change? By looking to him. I'll just read some passages. Math, uh, Psalm 25. Listen to what the psalmist says here. How do you want to change? How do you keep your eyes focused on Christ? What do I do? Again, this is so simple. It's just like right before us. The question is, and the challenge is for each one of you, for each one of us, is are we doing this? Are we doing this? Because it's there. It's there for us as Christians. How do we change? Lord, the psalmist says in Psalm 25, make me to know your ways, Lord. Your ways, not mine. Make me to know. Teach me your path. See the dependence on the Lord. I'm looking to you because I can't do this on my own. That's going to be futile, right? It's going to be sin-laden or filled with pride or whatever. But as I look to you, you teach me to be the man that I need to be according to your word. Right? You show me. You help me to make me know your ways. You lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Right? So we're looking to him. We're waiting on him. It's not even Lord... Give me the strength to change. It's, Lord, change me and then move me to, to live in this way, to live for you. Understand? Okay. Uh, number two, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. He has changed us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
True change happens by him. Listen to what, what Paul writes and says. Beginning in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. He says, listen, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to be in the kingdom of God. You're not, you can't live in that way apart from Christ. And what's he say after that? Such were some of you, but you've been washed. You've been saved. That's a picture of the cleansing of sin, even referring to, to profession and, and baptism. You've been washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's where change takes place. You were washed. Your sins are forgiven. Washed by the blood of Christ. You're not, you're not a slave, Romans says, to your sin anymore, to that old person that you were. Right? You can say no by the grace of God and by the power. Truly say no. Lastingly say no. Not just like for a time. Again, we struggle with sin and we're going to go back and forth at times. But we're not under that bondage anymore. We've been released by Christ. Do you believe that? See, if you believe that and, and seek Him, yeah, change. that's where change happens. Right? You were sanctified. That's in the past tense. You know what sanctified means? It means to be made holy. Okay? It's, our sanctification is definitive right now in heaven. That's why we don't have to go to purgatory or anything like that. We go straight to heaven because we are in Christ sanctified. At the same time, we are being sanctified. We're being changed. We're becoming more and more like Christ because the Holy Spirit is working within us. Okay? So we need to take hold of that. Say, yes, Lord, continue to work in me, looking to him. You change me. Because we get really insecure when we have to rely on him and not fall back to you know, who we are and our characteristics. I've been justified. I'm declared righteous before you. This is, this is, these are past tense. This is who I am in Christ already. Now we're living up to this by, his, by the power of his spirit, by the grace of God. This is who we are. So we can change. He does change us. He transforms our lives. So it is, it is possible. You don't have to be that person you used to be in that way, or maybe you are right now. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And this is a section here. It really speaks to who we are in Christ. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17. Now I say this and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. We're different. That's the difference that Christ makes in us. Not because we're special or wonderful people in and of ourselves, because of what Christ has done in us. We have a different mind. We're transformed, being renewed in the spirit of our minds. Don't walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of their heart. See, they need Jesus. They've become callous. They've given themselves up to sensual, greedy practices of every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learn Christ. It's not how you learn Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him, were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to do what? To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one. Be angry don't, and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give an opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may be grace given to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, malice, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ has forgiven you. See, this is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who we are and are able to do in Him. And you notice there is that the, the one principle I will bring out for sure is the putting off and putting on. This is what we're able to do. This is what we're called to do, to put off that old man. We're not under that bondage. But it's not enough just to put off that anger and wrath. 
You also have to put on. It has to be replaced okay? with grace, with joy, whatever, whatever you're, you're dealing with. So you put off. <clears throat> you don't steal anymore. If you were a thief, you're a Christian now. You put that off, but you put on going to work. Okay? You don't just say, well, I'm not going to steal anymore. You go to work. Okay? This is what we do. This is what we continue to do. We put off <clears throat> the old man and put on the new. Use what he's given you in your natural abilities, your characteristics, your personalities, to honor him. Right? That's really cool. So you can be a very strong leader right? and, and, and that decisive person without being overbearing and so prideful. Lord, take that away from me. You've given me this wonderful gift of leadership. Help me to be that leader you've called me to be. I know it sounds simple, but are you doing that? Right? Are you allowing that to get into there, to, to go to other places? It's wonderful to be passionate about things. Let me let my passion be for you, Lord Christ, and, and, and use in an appropriate way, not in a selfish way, what I just get passionate about. Let your passion be my passion, to love my wife as I need to, to be the person you've called me. That's, that's the idea. That's what we're called to do here. So when it comes to these kinds of things, listen, spouse, the spouses of this, as you're working on yourself, <clears throat> Don't necessarily try to manipulate your husband. I know you want to encourage and try, but don't try to trick your spouse into being that, you know, different. Hey, honey, try this kind of thing. We're Christians, man. We don't need to psychologize or try to manipulate. Just be straight up. You know, take it to the Lord. Don't demand change. Nah, if you don't change, I'm out, you know. That's not going to get too far. I know there's a temptation. You know, maybe a place to you know, seek that, but if you're just doing that, and don't simply resign. Don't say, I guess this is who I'm stuck with the rest of my life. Well, you are, <laughs> in a way. But <laughs> there's something you can do. You can pray. Seriously, patiently pray for change in them and understanding for yourself. I know many, several, even in this congregation, my congregation, where wives have been praying for their husbands for how long? Years. Patiently praying for their husbands. And you know what? The Lord has worked in their hearts, and they're here now. You talk to these women and say, you know, five years ago, my, mom, my husband wouldn't even set foot near this place. Two years ago, he wouldn't be here, right? So what are you called to do in that regard? Because when you're demanding change or trying to manipulate change or just resigning, that's not going to help. That's not going to recover the marriage for Christ. So as you're working on yourself, taking the log out of your own eye, be praying patiently for your spouse to be that person she, he or she's called to be for the Lord. And you know what? The bottom line is this. I'm just going to say it. For Christians, if you're truly Christian, if you're truly Christian and love the Lord, the most attractive thing that you could have in a spouse, the thing that never gets old, is their pursuit of Jesus Christ. Isn't it? Don't you love that? Women, don't you love your husband who loves Christ more than he loves you, more than he loves anything else? So, Because that's where you become the spouse you need to be. As husbands, when your wife is loving on the Lord, and in the Word, you're together in the Lord. That, that pursuit of Christ, that's attractive. No? Yeah, for sure. That you love Him. That your knowledge of Him is growing. That your obedience to Him. Your reliance on Him. To know that you're truly trusting in Christ, resting and depending on Him, is the best thing that I could ever have in a spouse. And that permeates the marriage. See, this is what I want you to think about and wrestle with. We know this stuff. So you're not learning anything you don't know. You need to do it. Okay, number C. I always I say number. Letter C. A <laughs> couple more. Um, you need to ask yourself this question too. Ask yourself, who are you serving in your marriage? It's really important. And I want to be careful here because there's overlap, but definitely ask yourself this question. Who are you serving in your marriage? Number one, is it yourself? Am I serving me in my marriage? In other words, what's my expectation expectations for marriage. Now listen, I'm going to tell you straight up. It's not wrong. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have expectations in marriage. You do, and you should, and we would. But here's the deal. Let your expectations be biblical expectations that are, that are you know, realistic expectations. And even those, you need to know, will not always be met. Most of the time, they won't be met. That's why we put up with each other. We need to manage our expectations, your expectations of marriage. Because that's a big... <sighs> It causes so many problems. You know, who are you serving? Is it yourself? If your happiness, I want you to check this out, hinges on your ideal of what marriage is, 
if that ideal must be met, I'm telling you right here, right now, then you're in trouble. Because <laughs> we really just that, that. If your happiness hinges on this thing, this one thing, you're going to be let down. So your focus needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, you can finish this sentence in your mind. If only it were like this, fill in the blank, then I would be happy. What are you going to fill the blank in with? I think if it's anything other than my spouse loving Jesus Christ, I don't know. Because we're going to let it, it's going to be. Wives, you know this. If you've been married more than a year or maybe less, okay, two months. <laughs> that you're not necessarily married to the man of your dreams or you thought he would be, right? He's not Prince Charming. Husbands, you know, she's not going to be Cinderella, right? And we're hoping. That's a good movie, by the way, <laughs> the latest Cinderella one. Um, with that strength, that, that's, if you're continually chasing this ideal of marriage, It's going to end in disappointment, discouragement, and discontentment. It just will. That's where, that's where it's going to go to. You need to shift your focus to Jesus Christ. Again, it sounds so simple. It is sounding simple. But it's profoundly, in many ways, difficult to do. Because oftentimes it conflicts with what we want and what Christ would have for us. And if your expectations are biblical, then you pray, Lord, please bring my spouse into conformity with that. If it is that, you know, loving Christ, that's the hope. Shift your focus to Christ. First of all, he won't let you down. We'll let you down. We'll let each other down. Christ will never let you down, leave or forsake you. So we look to him. So number one, where's your focus? It doesn't mean you're not focused. It doesn't mean you don't have expectations for marriage. Let them be biblical and understand they won't be met. That can't be the main thing for sure. Number two, is it your spouse or your children? This is a big one. Again, let me explain this. Because <laughs> it's good to have focus on your family, obviously. There's a show called that, Focus on the Family, right? Is that still on, by the way? Oh. Yeah, okay. I used, Thompson used to do it. I know he doesn't anymore. He doesn't lead it anymore. But anyway, um, and so it's good. What I'm saying here, what you need to understand, is the unhealthy, unbiblical dependence on a spouse and or children for your identity, purpose, meaning in life, right? Of course, they make up our family, our spouses. They make up part of that, a large part of that, our identity, our purpose, you know, serving them, for sure. There's not, absolutely. But they can't be your all in all. That's the idea. Listen to me. If that's all you're living for, again, who are you serving? Is it your spouse and your children in your marriage, primarily? If that's all you're living for, then it's really easy to make idols out of them. Out of, your, out of your family, out of your spouse, and just kind of up, you know, hold them up to, to this thing. The other thing you have to understand about our idols is they let us down all the time. 100% of the time, they're going to let you down. So if you're idolizing, I'm not saying you shouldn't admire your spouse and love it. That would be great and wonderful. But if, that, if, that, if your life is, is in that person and, and everything about you depends on that person to bring you happiness, joy, fulfillment, you know, all, all those kinds of things, you're in trouble, man. And when it goes bad, it goes bad. Now, I know this isn't, this is definitely extreme, but you hear, hear, hear stories about a wife who finds out that her husband is having an affair, cheating on her. He comes home, the two kids and the wife are dead. She kills the kids and kills herself. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to, like, use hyperbole or anything. I'm just saying, when you make idols... That's, that's the extreme. Or a husband finds out that he's let his family down. He, he you know, lost his job, doesn't have this, nothing really to live for because he's living for his family only. Comes home, kills his family, kills himself. There are stories like that. Again, they're the extreme, but this kind of thing affects. If, that, if that's it, if you're upholding them, again, it doesn't mean that you don't love them. Of course you love deeply. You serve abundantly. You, you give yourself to your, to your spouse, to your family. You care for them. But even they can't be your all in all. Only Jesus Christ deserves that place in your life. You understand? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But are you doing it? That's, I'm pressing that. Are you doing that? Where's your focus? 
on yourself, just those expectations, on your spouse or family, or properly on Jesus Christ. That's where our focus needs to be all the time. Why? Because it's the only way to find fulfillment in number one and number two. When you're focused on Christ, number, two, number one and number two are going to work themselves out in a wonderful biblical way. It's so important that Christ is the foundation, that he's above self, he's above your spouse, he's above, yeah, even the children. Okay? Christ is there. Christ is first. That's the only way he becomes the center and the focus of your marriage and of your family. Right? That's it. Who are you serving? Who are you looking to first? To the degree that you're serving Christ, listen, this is really important, you will be serving your spouse, your children, and your marriage in ways that are pleasing to the Lord and good for you in your marriage. That's the, that's the payoff. That's what comes out of that. Like, you know, you want to be serving over here and just so dependent on this and that and your spouse and doing this and finding meaning in this. No, 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 it's in Christ. And when you do that, those other things come as a result of that, they flow from that gospel. They flow from that relationship in Christ. That makes sense? That's why he needs to be our focus as Christians. The reason is, as you look to him, he does direct you. We just read that. He teaches us. He leads us by his word and spirit to be the kind of spouse that we're called to be. Right? To, to have that perspective. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. The thing is, are we doing that? It leads into, even this idea leads into the next point, which is number or letter D. Follow the leader, lead the follower. It's a big deal, especially in our day and age, right? <laughs> this, is, this is about headship and submission. This is tough stuff for us today. Why? Why is this so hard for us today? It's absolutely counterculture, right? <laughs> we're living in a culture. This, again, if we're doing this on a college campus, we're dead. I mean, we're like in jail. We're, you know, we're going to be beaten up for sure at the very least because we're talking about headship and submission. It's absolutely counter what we're exposed to every day on the news and in the world around us. But you know what? As Christians, we need to embrace this. We can't like make apologies for it or kind of excuse it or try to get around it. This is beautiful and wonderful. These are concepts given to us by the Lord. This is how our marriages are strengthened, how we recover biblical marriage. This is one of the ways we do it. We embrace this without shame, without fear, and not grudgingly. Biblical submission. Let's turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 5. And we'll just read straight from Scripture, and we're going to talk about this for a little bit. See these ways? Again, I'm not giving you necessarily these principles, techniques, try to do this, try to do that. The challenge is Christ. Look to Christ. All right? And are you doing what you know for the most part already? Okay? Well, here it goes again. Layer after layer. Number um, Ephesians 5, uh, beginning in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're all members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Sound familiar? This mystery is profound, and yet I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. Okay? Now, what I want to do before we start talking about submission and headship is this. I want you to go back to um, verse, um, verse 9 of the 6th chapter. And Paul's speaking about these kinds of relationships, children, parents, bond servants to masters. In verse 9, he says, Masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, that there is no partiality with him. 
I'm sorry, I totally read the wrong scripture. <laughs> Let me go back to chapter 5. I, I was reading in 6. Chapter 5, verse 20, he says this, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. And then verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. So before we talk about headship and submission, what you need to get down first and what's so important initially is this. As Christians, as Christians, first of all, it's about mutual sub submission. That we're submitting to one another. Submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. That's, that's the equality we have in Christ. That's, that's, that's the, the level of Christianity. In other words, before you're a husband, before you're a wife, you are a Christian. Before you're anything else, before we're anything else in any other relationship, we are Christians. Right? And that means that we're loved with the same love of Christ, the same depth. Right? And that's always amazing to me. And I, I say this to my congregation often. Do you know that the Lord loves you as much as he loves the Apostle Paul or Peter. What? Are you kidding me? As much as that? No, those guys are up there. No, 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 no. His love is just as far, just as wide, just as deep, just as passionate, just as personal for, for, them, for them as it is for you, for all of us as Christians. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, and, and his love goes out to all of us. There's co complete equality in that. So understand that before we get into what we're talking about here. Because he goes on to say, within marriage, for the wife, she's to submit to her husband. How? As unto the Lord. As unto Christ. In other words, for his sake. Not for your own, not even for your, your spouse's sake, but for Jesus' sake. This is why you do that. And it's such a beautiful thing in that regard because it mirrors something. Do you know your submission mirrors the relationship within the Godhead? Do you understand that? When you submit to your husband? Because in the Godhead, how many gods are there? One. How many persons? Three. One God, three persons. One God, same in substance, equal in power and glory. There's complete equality in the Godhead. But functionally, what did Jesus Christ do? He submitted himself to the Father. He came to do the Father's will. He left the glories of heaven, put on the flesh in order to live for us. So, so we see that the Son coming to do the Father's will. He came to serve, not to be served, and give his life a ransom for many. That servant's heart is what's seen, and that's what's mirrored in submission, a willingness to serve, a willingness to, to do that for the sake of Christ. So it mirrors Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. Isn't that precious? When you're doing that, you're, you're showing the character of the, of the son in that way in that loving way biblical submission mirrors christ now before we go any further you have to understand that submission never involves sin please understand that please know that let me elaborate just a little bit it doesn't mean and it never involves abuse if you're a christian wife and your husband is abusive to you remember you're christians first so that doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, he's my husband, and I need to submit to him, and I just need to. That's not what biblical submission is. If there's any kind of abuse, the first thing you need to do is, well, I don't know which order, let your elders know in the church, this is what my professing, loving Christian husband is doing, right? Who I'm seeking to serve. Number two, call the authorities if there's abuse going on because you're Christians first, and they're accountable to God, and where there's sin involved, they need to answer for that, right? So that's not biblical submission. You know, people, well, my husband's this, and I'm trying to be a submissive wife. Not when sin is involved like that. Number two, um, again, where there's, where there's adultery, there's some wives, well, I know that he's cheating on me, but I'm his wife, and I need to say, wait a minute, no. You're Christians first. What you need to do is go to the elders of the church, go to the pastor of the church, let them know what's going on so they can deal with that. That's not biblical submission, right? And I know that it's very difficult for many to embrace this rule, especially in the culture that we live in. And it doesn't mean, submission doesn't mean that you're passive or that you're weak in any way. Don't ever confuse submission, humility, with being passive and weak. Was Jesus weak? Was Jesus passive in that way when he came? Now, there's that strength of humility and and. Being passive and weak are two different things. Read Proverbs 31. 
that's a, a, a woman, a strong woman in the Lord. Think about the women that followed Christ. Were they weak? Huh? They were the strong ones, man. They, they followed their Savior and they provided for their Savior. And even when all the dudes left because they were scared and they were running, where were the women? They were there at the cross, okay? See, that's strength. That's submission. That's what we're talking about here. That's a biblical aspect of that. It doesn't mean that you have no influence. No, not at all. Your opinion, your wisdom is valued. Guys, if we think about it, I don't know, 95, 98% of the time when we talk to our wives and they give us what they have, yeah, that's the wisdom there. So, so submission doesn't mean that you have no opinion, that you're quiet. No, you have strong biblical opinions, wisdom that you bring into it, and valued for sure. And it doesn't mean that you don't have any authority because we have a shared authority, and especially within the home, there's authority there. What it does mean is this. It means that for Jesus' sake, to lovingly, and here it is, respect the authority, the position that God has afforded the husband in the home. It means that you show deference, respect, grace, encouragement, support, that you inspire and that you serve your husband as unto the Lord. That's what that means. You can't do that apart from Christ. The trick is, yeah, I can. <laughs> what do you need? Um, the list. Respect, authority, position. I mean, deference, respect, grace, encouragement, support. And by that, I mean with your gifts, with your talents. You don't withhold. Okay? Inspire and serve your husband as unto the Lord. That's for the sake of Jesus Christ, even if your husband doesn't necessarily deserve it. That's what that means. You do it as unto the Lord. Is that good? Okay. The trick is this. You, women, need to be very aware of this <laughs> in the struggle that you have. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.16. What's Genesis 3.16 say? Do I have to read it? You know it? The curse on the woman? That your desire is going to be for your husband. Okay? What's that mean? It means this. Check this out. I'm going to be tough on you, but I'm going to be tough on the guys. Don't go anywhere, Andy. You've got to come back for the guys. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Go now. If you go, go now because I want you to be back for the guys. Here's what you, got. Here's what you get. Understand this, and this is what you have to be aware in yourself, that your natural inclination since the fall is that your desire to be for your husband is this. The idea of that in the Hebrew is this that you have a desire to rule over. That's what that means. To take over, to struggle for dominance. Okay? Sweet, cute, nice as you may be. That's, that's part of the natural inclination since the fall. Your desire is for your husband. You want your husband to lead, but at the same time you resent it. Huh? To, to a degree, to a point. You want him to lead, but you want him to lead the way you want him to lead. So who's really leading? <laughs> you know, like, Here's what you need to do to be a leader. Okay, <laughs> because I'm following you, right? This, this is the inclination. This is what you need to be aware of. This is the way it is. For the most part, of course, the Lord changes this and can change. When he fails to lead, you resent him. He's weak. When he tries to lead, you resist, don't you? Oftentimes. Be aware of this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm telling you to be aware of this. And this is why Jesus needs to be your focus. Because if you want to learn what submission really looks like, you need to look at Christ. You need to look at the life of Jesus Christ. You need to know that he put on the flesh, submitted, and came to do this will. He lowered himself to serve us to the glory of the Father. Who are we not to do? Even when he gets down and shows us that when he watches his disciples' feet, that's an act of submission, saying this is what you guys need to do for each other. Take my rule. Take my lead in this. So you need to look to him. He came to serve, not to be served. So be aware of that. And seek the Lord. Again, don't try to fight it. Don't try to change it because you're just going to end up in the same place. Transformation comes as you acknowledge these things and bring them before the Lord and seek his will and say, Lord, Please transform my heart. It goes against my natural inclination. I don't know where it's going to go, but I want 
to obey you. Right? Okay. Where's Andy? Ah, just in time. <laughs> All right, biblical headship. Gentlemen, we want our wives to follow us, and yet far too often we fail to lead them as we ought to. Let's just face it. Let's just be honest. And there's a vacuum of leadership in so many marriages, right? And that's going to be filled oftentimes by the wife or something else, the kids. I don't know. Something's going to fill that leadership vacuum when we left. We can't lord this over our wives, the, the position we have. We've got like five minutes. We should be done right before noon. Um, we can't lord it over our wives. We can't demand that they submit to us. You know, we can't pull rank on them. I'm the husband. I'm, the, you know, I'm your spouse. Listen to me. If you have to assert or keep reminding your wife that you're the head, it's over. You've lost already. It's done for. You know that. I got news for you. It's already over. You know, you have to, occasionally you need to be reminded who's in charge. We all do. But if that's a constant refrain, I'm the head of the household. I'm the leader. God gave me. It's over already. You're not there. That there's not the respect's not there. Something's missing. Okay. Do you know what it means? As I read the list about Christ loving His church and presenting our sanctified before, do you know what the implication is that for Scripture? Do you know what biblical headship calls for? Do you know what it requires? Buckle up. <laughs> Here we go. Be a godly husband. It requires this, and there's no fudging on this. It requires great strength while at the same time deep humility. <laughs> you can have strength, but with that humility. Why? Because it's Jesus that mirrors Jesus. Great strength with deep, profound humility. It requires a strong leader with a servant's heart. Because you can have a strong leader who just bullies and we're going to do it this way, but you need the servant's heart. And it's that servant's heart that makes a strong leader, like Jesus. It requires and demands fierce loyalty, even if your bride isn't perfect. Right? Christ is loyal to us. He's not going to leave or forsake us. We're not perfect in him. Biblical headship requires fidelity and devotion that's demonstrated and unquestioned. Right? Just as we looked at fidelity, just the faithfulness, that, that person's faithful in every single way and devoted to me, devoted to my well-being, devoted to our family. And that needs to be demonstrated, not just say, hey, I'm a husband and I love my family. Okay, show me. And unquestioned, of course he is. Of course he does. It needs to be love. Biblical headship includes love in all aspects of love. The three big ones in Scripture, there's the, the passionate kind of love. Christ is passionate for his church he pursues us. He loves us. Now, it translates a little bit different in our marriages, but there needs to be that passion, that pursuit, that love, that romance, right? There needs to be the, the philios, that friendship love, too, that kind of love where there's a deep friendship. It's not one or the other. Oh, you need all of these where, where you're so close and you laugh together and you hang together and you love the same things and it's cool together, right? And it also requires... The agape love, the unconditional love, the I love you no matter what. Right? No matter what, I'm yours. That's what that requires. Okay? To be a biblical head requires that you provide, that you provide all that's needed in every sphere for your spouse and for your family, spiritually, physically, emotionally, that you provide. Like Christ provides in every... See. The impossibility of this, I think, I, I, I'm crushed right now, and I'm only halfway through. Um, to protect. Biblical headship means protect your family in every way, in every sphere, spiritually, physically, emotionally. You're the protector. You're the one who watches out for them. You're the one who makes sure that they're safe and taken care of, just like Christ does for us. Be patient. Yeah, right. How many of the dudes are patient with your wife? It's one of the things I was patient, understanding, and gracious. Are you kidding me? I'm ready to get it. Now, let's do it. To be a biblical head in your family. See, this is what you need to be looking for, women. <laughs> Not going to happen. To be sacrificial. To be sacrificial. Where your decisions benefit those around you more than they do yourself. 
to give yourself in that way? Would you, your decision benefit others, to benefit your spouse? Will, will you care not as much for yourself? Again, this, so many husbands they just care about themselves and my way, and this is what we're going to do. No, it's sacrificial. Will you care not about yourself as much as you do for your spouse and for your family? And he does what he does. This is biblical headship. You do those things that you do without keeping a record, without complaining about it, without lording it over. It means forgiving. Forgiving. Quickly, comprehensively, that it's forgotten, that it's gone. It's okay. We're called to be husbands who inspire confidence, inspire loyalty, who foster security and comfort. We're called to be a man that you just love to love. I can keep going, but I'm going to have mercy on us guys right now. I mean, if you're a wife right now, it's like, yes, right. You know, you're, you're probably nudging your husband and you're going, huh, 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 huh. If you're a husband, you're looking for the exit. You're doing what Scott's doing. You're just getting out of here right now. You're, you're not making eye contact with your wife. I'm not looking at Laura. I'm just kind of squirming a little bit. Man, if we're serious about this, and we need to be serious about this, right now we're pretty much crushed. You see just how inadequate you are as a husband. And you know what? If you do... That's not necessarily a bad thing if it helps you realize that you can't begin to be the husband that you need to be for your wife and the father you need to be for your family without absolute, complete, and resolute dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He needs to be our focus. You understand? How are we doing in that? This is it. This is, this is, this is the only way we can begin to get to the place we need to get to or be. As we focus on Christ, in a sense individually, but then corporately coming together, husbands and wives, in order to do what he requires of you and what he expects of us as his people, we need to realize that it can't be done apart from him. I'm telling you, nothing that you don't already know, but how are you doing? That's, that's the push back. That's, what, that's, the, that's the big thing. That's the trick here today. How are you doing in this? Because I'm not giving you anything you don't necessarily know. But what are you doing about it? We need to cultivate our relationship with Christ together. Seriously. One more thing and we're done. Uh, e, we need to resist the world and embrace the word. Resist the culture and embrace Christ. Okay. Popular culture dictates, sets the trends of so much of how we view marriage and relationship. It's very uh, intentional and it's very influential. I don't care. I know you guys watch television. I know you see the shows. I know you know what's going on online, all those kinds of things. And so much of what you see and what you hear, what you're experiencing, is absolutely contrary to what the Bible teaches about marriage. And so you're conflicted in some ways, in different ways. How am I supposed to be this? How am I supposed to do that? For instance, um, marriage. We know in popular culture, it's just a reversal of God's intention, right? Divorce, that's liberating. I'm not stuck with that dummy anymore. I can go live my life. Lots of TV shows, especially in the 70s and 80s, the kind of, you know, that singleness type of thing. You could, you could see those trends in the culture to where it is today. Infidelity, that's self-fulfillment. I'm not getting what I need at home. I'm going to go over there, and that's, hey, you know, that's, that's what we see it as in the culture. And we're bombarded with it. So we get, you know, here's what Scripture says. Here's what the world's doing. What are we doing? Being a loving, submissive wife, that's the unpardonable sin in the culture today. Again, Go and say that. Go and tell people just about anywhere else in, other than a church that believes the Bible that you're a submissive wife. You seek to be that and, and check out the reaction. That is uh, um, a godly leadership. That's seen as male chauvinism in our, in our culture. This is what we're up against. Parents, dad, oftentimes you're just portrayed as a fool, as a dummy, as a pushover, which is partly true. But for us, you know, and, and mom, you're the cool one, kind of. You might be tough, you know, you're the tough one, but, but you're kind of cool and you get them a little bit more. Do you see the reversal in the marriage and the, and the uh, relationship there? That's, that's what it is. What we need to do, very consciously, is resist the world and embrace the word, right? 
biblical marriage will always be counterculture, just like being a Christian. You know? it'll, it'll, it'll often be counter you, too, right? as we talked about here, because of our sinful inclinations. Marriage isn't necessarily about five keys, seven principles. Th those things have a place. <clears throat> it's about you individually and together determining that you will live for Christ. That's it. That's what it is. The bottom line is this. When you pursue Christ, when you surrender to him, he will teach you. He will shape you. He will mold you. He will bend you. He will break you. He will build you up. He will sustain you. Right? And when you pursue Christ, you will be more faithful in your marriage because you know how faithful he is to you even when you're so faithless. Right? That's why. That's what you learn when you pursue Christ. His faithfulness to you. You will be more patient and understanding when you realize, and you can only realize this through His Word, through prayer, through relationship with Him, when you realize how patient He is with you and how much He puts up with from you and still loves you and still understands you. See, it's going gonna, it's gonna to permeate. You, you will be more forgiving in your marriage. Seriously as you pursue Christ, when you realize the depth of the forgiveness you've received in Him because of your sins. Right? Well, sometimes we have a much higher standard with our spouses than, we do, than Christ does with us. But when you realize the depth of that forgiveness, it's going to be, you're going to have that willingness to truly forgive and know what that means. And that only comes through fostering a relationship with Christ. Sometimes we read the books and they're okay. I'm not saying they're necessarily not bad, but they almost kind of get us around what we need to really be doing. And that's focusing in on Christ. You know, we could do this action over here. And it has Christ. And I'm not, again, I don't want to disparage too much because some are very helpful. But let's get back just to really the basics. You're going to be m more selfless when you understand that he's given himself for you completely. The deeper you know that, the more you know how much Christ gave for you, gave of himself and is given to you. As we understand that, as we come to grips with that, that we're just going to overflow with that gratitude. It's going to be part of who we are and understand that. So we're not going to be so selfish and I need this and I need that. Right? It just goes on. And loving as well. Once you, as you read the word, and, and understand the depth of his love for you. Again, and how unloving you could be towards him, right? We go through those seasons. I'm just like not into you right now, Jesus. I'm just going my own way. And he still loves you. And he still pursues you. And that's not going to change. See, when you come back to that, it's going to, all right, this is the love with which I need to love with as well. Do you understand? So this is what it's, it's It's simple enough, but it's deep if you take it seriously. Not to perfection, because there's never going to be perfection in our marriages or in this Christian life, in this life, but absolutely towards it. The only way to recover biblical marriage is by pursuing Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you so much. Thank you, Lord, for this time and just ask your blessing uh, upon the rest of our day this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I pray that you would be with Luke as he brings his presentation. And I ask now, Lord, that you would bless this time of fellowship as we gather, bless this food to our use and us to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. I am sorry, guys. I did run over a little bit. I wanted to finish at noon. It's like 10 after. But the food is back there. It's ready. I prayed so you guys could line up and...
Fleetwood Mac called, and the world system answered. Listen up, zombies. Yeah. Would you consider yourself to be a good apple? So you're Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> to me, you're white. Am I wrong? I mean, if you see white, <laughs> work on your kids. They're going to need it. That's not love that's in the air. You can't out sin God's grace. Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the Wretch, the song refers to uh, lies, lies, sweet little lies, the world system. It's all it does. I am not talking about the world. Stuff is good. Carpet, fine, enjoy it. The things that God makes and gives to us, mmm, bacon, it's very tasty and joy, because we have been given the world to subdue and to enjoy so that we can glorify God. That's why we bow our heads before we consume the food that he's given to us. That's the world. I'm talking about the world system here. It lies. Why? Because the world system is any ideology, religion, idea, any statement that is offered as truth is not. It is a non-Christian worldview. It is the world system, and its main tenets are love stuff, love yourself, you're a good person. And another big whopper is marriage is all about you. That is a lie. And Rick Thomas exposes the lies of the world what they say marriage is supposed to be versus what the Bible says marriage is supposed to be. If you're married, thinking about getting married, know anybody who is married, please consider very carefully your own situation. Have I bought the lie? Or do I understand marriage to be what the Bible says. Here's the list. Uh, number 20, the world says marriage solves our problems. God says, no, it reveals our problems. Yeah. <laughs> Does your marriage ever revealed maybe shortcomings? I can't possibly. possibly. Okay. Can I just, can I just, the guy who thinks like that? <laughs> That was is, me. Is the biggest problem in the house. <laughs> yeah. Not me. Yeah. I was so spiritual until I got married. And then you <laughs> realized you're a jerk. Right. <laughs> like the rest of us. Exactly. That's what marriage does. Luther said it's a school of character. That's what the home is. And that's what marriage will do. It doesn't make problems automatically go away. It reveals that you've got a bunch of them. And if you do not realize that about yourself, I got to tell you something. I, I, I would put money on this, that the reason for most of the problems in your home is that attitude. Recently, you received an email. I gotta tell you, I just went, oh, young lady, oh, it is such a joy to tell you that what you wrote in the content of this email is exactly the way you should be thinking about marriage. She said, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion after being married for a year that I've got a lot of issues Oh, congratulations. Now you're ready to be married. The person who doesn't think he or she has issues is a nightmare. Everybody has to walk on eggs around you. Everybody's got to mind their P's and Q's. Everybody's got to come up with another food analogy of some sort. You are most likely the issue because you are not seeing the log in your own eye. Lie number 19. The world says marriage brings happiness. God says, no, well, yeah, a marriage should lead to holiness. That doesn't mean that marriage doesn't make us happy, but what is the siren song of the world? It'll make you happy, and if it doesn't make you happy, no fault divorce, get out of there. $69, we got a coupon, so invite the neighbor, it's a two for one. The world says that's all marriage is about. God says, no, no, primarily, it is about holiness. Why? You and I, are so blinded about ourselves. My estimation of me, it, it is so wonky. It is so off the chart bad. 
It is so blind to the way that I really am. I need help, and our spouses should provide that help. Lie number 18. The world says it's good if you never argue. God says, no, 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 no. I want to grow you through arguments. No, God doesn't want us fighting, but he wants to do more than simply put the lid on arguments. When we stifle it, knock it off. There'll be no fighting in this house because I hate it and I had too much of it when I was a kid. We're not going to do it in this home. Okay, that might be some helpful information, but that only brings about hmm, conformity. God wants those situations that can bring about tension not to simply be squashed, but to be worked through so that we can mature. Ask yourself the question, do our arguments, do our stressful scenarios ever bring about more holiness? Number 17 from Rick Thomas. The world says marriage shouldn't be work. God says, ha, 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 ha. Some people are told it should just happen. It, it, you should just be able to get along. This is kind of a no-brainer. Marriage is supposed to be really zesty and really fun. And you shouldn't have to work. I got to tell you something. That would be a lie. Instead, marriage is supposed to be work. Why? Because it is a device that God uses to bring us into a scenario that grows us. That's what marriage is about, not exclusively, but marriage is really about holiness, along with all the other stuff. Number 16, the world says marriage is about feelings. God says, mm -mm, commitment over feelings. The reality is there are going to be times when you don't feel like being married. And it is in those moments God says, you promised. Marriage, if it is based on feelings, no wonder why the divorce rate is through the roof. No wonder why people just skedaddle and abandon everything because they are lied to and told marriage is all about happiness. And if you're not feeling it, you have irreconcilable differences, but we're still best friends. That's why so many people vamoose. Instead, it's about a covenant promise. And it's a covenant promise that reflects a greater covenant promise. The man is playing the role of, of Jesus. The woman is playing the role of the church. They come together till death do them part. Just like Jesus and the church, which means if you end up scooting away from your life and your scenario and your family and your situation because you're just not happy and you have no biblical grounds for divorce, then you are marring the picture of the gospel. That's why God hates divorce. When we return, more lies from the world system that perhaps you have bought next on Wretched. When it comes to marriage, the world system says one thing, God says another. Welcome back to Wretched Rick Thomas. He's to bomb diggity. If you've never been to rickthomas.net, it will change your life. I'm not kidding. Also did a number of lectures with him for our drive-by marriage resource with a workbook. Oh, it is so good. It is so helpful. If you happen to be like Simon and Garfunkel, troubled waters right now. This might be the bridge that brings you together. Okay, that analogy, it didn't work out totally, but you get the point. Drive-by marriage, so helpful. And it's not, okay, you stupid jerk husband. Have you been doing this wrong? Hey, nagging wife, have you been a shrew? They are loving, they are tender, and yet they're going to get into your heart. And they're going to cause you to examine not your spouse, but yourself. I cannot recommend his website, rickthomas.net, or drive-by marriage 
enough. Let's take a look at the lies the world system peddles. And number 15, the world says marriage is about getting. God says, no, it's about giving. Why didn't somebody tell me this? Because I asked this question, who gives? When the situation is kind of like one of these deals, I've got opinions about it, which are, you know, I know they're right, of course, and my wife has another opinion, and obviously she's wrong. Who gives when we both think that we're right? And the answer is, I do. And the answer is, she does. I give, because I'm not in it to get. I am in it to serve. Uh, number 14, a world system lie about marriage. They say it should be 50-50. God says it's about giving 100%. I have seen and heard some very unbalanced sermons about this concept. Are we supposed to give 100%? Of course we are, emotionally, physically. We should spend ourselves on our families and our service to the church. But I've heard sermons that are just not balanced and they sound a little something, man, like this. All right, sir, you get home, and sure, you've worked hard all day, and you're exhausted. Put on your big boy pants, get into the house, do all the chores, rub your wife's feet, make sure you play with the children on the floor. Did you do the trimming along the lawn? Have you painted the house? Get on it, man, and give 100%. Now, there is some truth in that, but let's watch out that we don't make laws where there are no laws. There are some times when we're tired, and that is one of the benefits of marriage. I'm out of gas, but she isn't, and she helps because she's trying to give what she has. And I should be giving what I have, and I can't give what I don't got. So watch out for that type of preaching. A marriage lie and number 13 of the world system says you accept your spouse based on their behavior. God says you love in spite of behavior. Number 12 lie. The world says it's about equal rights. God says, no, we all surrender our rights to God. God does not want us insisting on our own ways. He wants us to surrender, not primarily to our spouse, because there are roles to be played in marriage, but to him, and when we're both doing that, that is when a marriage has harmony. They say it's motivated by your spouse's love. God says, no, silly rabbit. You should be motivated by Christ's love. This is agape. This is a love that says, I'm not loving you based on what you do, deliver, or give. I love you because I love you. Uh, this is top shelf love. It's not quid pro quo love. God loves you and me because he loves you and me. I, I know that was a complicated thought. God is love. It's his character. It's his nature. Typically, the world system says love gets kindled. Somebody brings something to me, a pleasure, a delight, some sort of emotional fix and then I grow in my love for them. And I get that process, but that's not how God loves. God does not love incrementally. God does not have different classes of Christians. The Christian who reads his Bible three hours a day, he really loves that Christian. But the one who only reads his Bible for two hours a day, eh, no. God is love, and he loves because he loves, not contingent on us, which means it is an immutable love. It is a never-changing love because he's immutable, and he never changes, and he's constant, always loving, despite how we behave, not because of how we behave. A world system lie about marriage. Number 10, the world says it's a contract. God says it's a covenant. Big difference. Till death do you part, you're not getting out of this. Contract, get me my lawyer and get me out of this mess. A number nine lie from the world system. It's about behavior. God says no marriage is about motives of the heart. Why? 
because God is interested in marriage, in the sanctification process. He is always fixated on what is going on on the inside. Oh boy, I might regret this. Hosea 6.6, 6, God speaking to Israel, I do not desire sacrifice. I want faithfulness. I want loyalty. I do not want burnt offerings. It's a bit of a paraphrase, but that's basically what it says. God has never been interested in being religious. Now, that doesn't mean that religion doesn't have systems. Religion isn't a bad word, but God isn't just about religion. He wants this, and marriage should be changing this. And if it's not, then maybe you have purchased a world system lie. When we return on Wretched, we got some time to make up. Nine more lies from the world system. Have you bought them? Next on Wretched. All right, people, let's make this snappy. We've got nine more to go. Welcome back to a wretched Rick Thomas offering 20 lies the world system tells about marriage. Let's get to number eight. And you say, I thought you just said nine. There are nine more. Rick, he ran out of gas. So I made one up. Here we go. Number eight, the world system says, trust your spouse's goodness. God says, no, no, you better trust my goodness. Why? Every spouse sometimes fails to be good. And if you're trusting that, relying on that, when she or he fails, you're going to go down and skin your knees or worse, trust God's goodness. He never fails. Oh, the world system says, that you should run from suffering. God says, no, silly rabbit, embrace suffering. Number six, the world system says that marriage should be a source of joy. God says, no, I'm your source of joy. I, I know what you're thinking. Well, should I have no joy in marriage? Don't I get to delight in this? Yes, you do. But that is not our chief delight. Marriage is a pointer. Marriage is not the ideal. Intimacy is wonderful, but it's a pointer. So if you and I are focusing on relying on the lesser, it's like relying on the spotlight, the actual light, instead of the object that it's trying to illuminate. Our source of joy is God. And I promise you, the moment that we need our spouses to provide that, just get ready. You're going to take a tumble. The world says, love until it hurts. God says, that's a piece of cake. I want you to love until you die. Why? Because marriage is a picture of the gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ laid down his life for sinners, and we are to be reflecting that kind of love, even if it brings us to death. Please note, there is a caveat here that loving unto death does not mean that you don't deal with sins that are violent or outside of biblical marriage. You, you can get your elders involved. If there is abuse involved, you can call 911 because that actually is love. That was a little nota bene. And number four, the world system says, satisfaction is found in the other. Nope. God says it's found in Jesus Christ. If you and I don't grasp this, then you and I will forever be like Mick Jagger. And, and you don't want that. He can't get no satisfaction because people fail. Everything the world system says, this is going to make you happy, always falls short. Why? Because it's the lesser thing. The greatest thing there is, is God himself. And if we're not pursuing the best thing, we're settling for the lesser. And we're always going to be a wee bit disappointed. And we're probably going to go to war because it's going to become a quid, 
pro quo sort of, Latin is very difficult to speak, a quid pro quo sort of affair where it's like, you got to do this, and if you do, then I'll be happy. If you don't, then I won't. That's not marriage. Find your satisfaction in God. Number three, the world system says, marriage is about assigning blame. God says, no, accept the responsibility. Quit pointing, when you point a finger at somebody, you're pointing three fingers into your palm and one crooked finger at the studio lights. Don't do that. The number two lie from the world system, the world says it's about the couple. God says, no, it is about glorifying God. Do we get any benefits? Yes, we get to enjoy a spouse and the delights that that does indeed bring. But if our marriage is only that, it's not fulfilling its design to glorify God as we play our roles of Jesus and the church rightly so the world goes, oh, I get it. The gospel is good. I'm actually seeing it played out behind their windows because you live by some peeping toms. You glorify God when you play your roles well. If you do not, it's, it's, it's forever just, I just thought it would be more because you bought the lie. Lie number one from the world system. The world says marriage will solve that little porn problem. God says, no, it won't. Marriage is not going to make it stop. Pornography is not an external issue that has an external solution. It is an internal problem that has an internal solution that can only be found in God. Have you been buying any of the 20 lies? There's one more. Rick was very thorough, but this one is a Lulu these days. The world system says you don't need to get married. You just be in a committed relation. You write the terms. God says, no, I write the terms because marriage is a picture of the gospel. And he has set up the planet predominantly to be ordered and structured through the institution of marriage. Unless you've got the gift of singleness, God wants us to pursue a spouse. Now, he might give you the gift of singleness by not providing a spouse, but if that isn't the case, then we should be getting married because it's the way that God runs the planet. It is the institution that he has provided that we're to partake in in order to glorify him. Young person, don't let the world lie to you about that. And until tomorrow, go serve your king. All right, welcome back. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch. And there seemed to be enough food. I know we were concerned about that. So hopefully everybody got enough and you're all ready as we head down the home stretch here. Um, it's always a privilege to have these kinds of seminars. And especially today, it's such a worthy topic. And I'm really thankful to my dad. I know that you know it seemed like there was a lot of conviction anyway. And that was uh, really a tough act to follow uh, for me anyway. But um, marriage is, as we looked at, such a good topic to discuss. And as we saw, it's, it is so under attack in our society and being redefined and being um, just transformed by the world and disregarded in a lot of senses. And so it's worth coming out and doing these types of things. And I think that broadly in the Christian community, we do a pretty good job of addressing marriage. As you mentioned that, you know, you don't have to look hard to find books on the subject or these kinds of seminars. And so it's something that most Christians are aware of and that we're uh, eager to kind of address. But one thing that goes, oftentimes goes overlooked is the unmarried, is godly singleness. And so that's what uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about today. Because like marriage, singleness is under attack in our society. They're really, I don't know, at least from my own personal experience, it's hard to kind of 
find a good, solid, biblical foundation for singleness. There's not much out there. You know, like we have with marriage, you know, we can look, and there's a lot of material where you can kind of get a good idea of what biblical marriage looks like, but not so much for biblical singleness. Really, all we have is the world, and what we have in the world right now is a completely overly sexualized society where um, sexual immorality has absolutely become the norm in our society. I mean, it is expected, it's encouraged, it's embraced, and it's, uh, it's even celebrated. I mean, this is, um, yeah, and so for this reason, as, uh, as unmarried, I mean, married people too, but especially to the unmarried, we need to be very cautious uh, living in this world for these kinds of reasons. Sexual immorality has become normalized, and we get it from absolutely everywhere. We get it from TV, movies, music. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, everything living in this world, uh, family, friends, school, whatever. I mean, it's just, if you are in a teenager or a young adult and you're not sexually active, it's something strange. I mean, like, there's something wrong with you. You know what I mean? And so it becomes very easy for us to kind of start to go in that direction alongside of the world. Another reason we need to be careful is because uh, sexual morality is a sin to which we ourselves are very naturally bent. And so that, working in combination with how accepted it is in our society, makes it very easy to start crossing lines. I mean, just consider, I think, for pretty much, I would go to say everybody in this room, sexual immorality is a strong temptation for us. And I do believe that that comes from personal experience, but also that's the biblical witness. I mean, throughout Scripture, beginning to end, sexual morality is a temptation to God's people, and it characterizes uh, the rest of the world. This is something that it doesn't take a whole lot of convincing for us to kind of start crossing those lines, pushing it, and falling deeper and deeper into sexual immorality. And so these two things together create a pretty... Um, a pretty difficult uh, situation for unmarried Christians. And what ends up happening, I think anyway, at least I see in uh, broadly, in a, what ends up happening uh, in a lot of churches and for a lot of Christians is we start to kind of minimize sexual immorality and we start to, I don't know, it seems like in a lot of churches, sexual immorality is kind of looked at on par with lying where, yes, it's sinful, it's wrong, and you shouldn't do it. We're not going to say that it's okay, but I mean, everyone kind of does it, and it's really difficult. Nobody's perfect, and it's just something that happens, and you should repent, but it happens. And so we see, we start to like minimize that, especially because it's so embraced in the world. And so even in the church now, we're starting to, you know, look at sexual morality with a little bit of a lighter sort of look to it. But I want to say to you guys is that there is definitely... A scale. There are degrees of sinfulness. Not every sin is equally wicked or heinous in God's eyes. Now, obviously, every sin is equally wicked enough to send us all to hell, but there is a scale. And on that scale, and I think the Bible testifies to this, sexual immorality is on the upper end. It is one of the more serious sins that we can commit. And so as a church, we need to take this very seriously. And that should be all the more reason for we unmarried folks to be very, very careful because as I mentioned, sex is just in the world all around us. It's so easy, it's so accessible, and it's so encouraged. One place that we can go to in scriptures to kind of see um, how the Bible looks at sexual morality is 1 Corinthians 6. There's a lot of areas that we can go, but I think this is a good passage. So if you guys want to turn there, it's a pretty well-known passage uh, from the Apostle Paul. And I want you guys just to pay attention and keep this in mind as we go through this afternoon. And listen to how he sort of singles out sexual immorality and uh, its uniqueness. So 1 Corinthians 6, and I'm going to start right in the middle of verse 13. He says this, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For as is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? 
You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So Paul uses some pretty powerful words to talk about sexual immorality there. And I want you guys to notice a few points that he makes. One of them is that sexually, sexual immorality is a sin against our own body. And so unlike what he says, any other sin that's outside the body, this we commit against ourselves. But something else that's interesting to consider is what happens after we become a Christian. We become part of the one body of Christ with every other believer throughout all of history. We're spiritually united with one another. And sexual immorality also damages that body. It does damage. It's poisonous for the church. It really does damage the church. And beyond that, he compares that to, he says our bodies belong to the Lord, and he also compares it to our spiritual union with the Lord. And so there's also a sense here where sexual immorality damages our relationship to Christ in a way that's unique and different from other sin. I mean, of course, every sin is going to do some damage to our relationship, but sexual immorality, that being joined to another person in a similar way in which we're joined to Christ, it does some serious damage. Of course, not that you can lose your salvation, but... It's definitely serious. And so we see the weight, just from that one passage, we could go elsewhere, but even from that one, I think you guys see the weight that the Bible places on sexual morality, that it's nothing to be taken lightly or just to kind of brush aside and, you know, just say, well, you know, everyone does it. It's a hard temptation. We, we can, you know, it's, it's acceptable to a degree. So we need to stay away from that mindset. Listen. If we as unmarried people are interested then in pleasing God and in obeying him, we need to be willing to take a lot of precaution against sexual immorality. And so we need to know and understand where the Bible starts drawing the line, where, what is sinful in regards to this. And this is such a loaded question, and this is where the conversation is always going to get a little bit more tricky because the Bible doesn't give us like we wish it had a list of, you know, you can do these things, this is okay, but this stuff over here is sinful, you can't do that. Now, of course, the Bible is explicit about a couple of things. Uh, for one thing, sex in any context outside of marriage is sinful. And I think any of us, I hope everybody in this room can, you know, get on board with that, no problem. Uh, obviously, we have the seventh, the seventh commandment. We have this passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, intrinsically in God's Uh, ordination of marriage in Genesis 2, which we read, you have that there as well, that sex is to be saved, to be within marriage between one man and one woman. But what I want to focus a little bit more on today is what Jesus referred to as lust, or uh, what you might read when you're reading through Paul's epistles, things like impurity, sensuality, filthiness, because that's also explicitly sinful. Um, In Matthew 5.28, a well-known passage, Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, we've all heard that, and I want us to kind of think about, we'll think about this a little bit more as we go on, but just the weight of that statement from our Lord. And he equates lusting with adultery, with sexual morality. That breaks the seventh commandment. And Paul, when he talks about, you know, impurity and sensuality and all those kinds of things, it's always included in lists that characterize unbelievers and the people who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So there's no question that lust is something that is explicitly sinful in Scripture. But then, so that begs the question, well, what is lust? What's classified there? And, I mean, it's... I'm not great with definitions, and it's hard to find one. I'm going to try here. Uh, It's going to be a little bit loose, but where I, lust is when you use another person who is not your spouse to gratify sexual or intimately relational desires. Now, I know that's a little bit of like a maybe messy, hopefully we can put a little bit more uh, meat on that. He says it's good. I don't know. Hopefully we can put more meat on that as we go on. Um, But really what I'm trying to say here is that lust is kind of the opposite of that selfless love that Christ shows us and that we're told to be imitators of. Because that kind of love, what it does is it lowers ourselves, it serves other people, counts others as more significant than ourselves. We're lust, we're using other people to satisfy our own uh, desires, our own needs. And so it really undermines that kind of love that we're supposed to have. Now you can lust after somebody who you're in love with. They're not like, that can happen, but it still it undermines that kind of biblical sacrificial love. And so what 
there's different uh, categories and dimensions to lust as well. And I think the first one that we often think about is physical lust. And that's kind of the most broad uh, category here. When you're actually using another person to explicitly gratify sexual desires outside of marriage, and whether that's with another person or just by yourself, that's lust and that's sinful. Once again, I think that, I mean, it's true. Um, once again, I think that, I hope that everybody here can be on board with that, that those more explicit acts, you guys know what I mean, that's lust and that's sinful, and we can't do that as Christians. But this also can include some more seemingly innocent uh, activities that we can get involved in. I don't like, you know, thinking about, you know, maybe kissing or, you know, even hugging or holding hands. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. But don't be deceived. We can use those kinds of things, as innocent as they are on the surface, we can use those to gratify sexual desires. And when we're doing that, we're lusting when that happens outside of marriage. Like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, get a little more clarity to that. And you might say to me, oh, you know, you know that's, that's, that's hard. I mean, that's so much of what dating is. That's so much of what our relationships are. I just want to warn you guys, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about is not going to be easy. And like I said, if we think about what Jesus said, that looking at somebody and lusting after them, when we look at someone with, in a sexual context and start to think about them in that way, if that's sexual immorality and that breaks the seventh commandment, then that logically follows that all this physical stuff uh, falls into that when we start to physically gratify those lusts. And think about that. Looking at someone lustfully, I mean, I think for so many of us, that's second nature. Even after we become Christians, this is something that's so hard. I mean, you, if you're not constantly on guard against this, then so oftentimes your mind is going to go there. I mean, I think all of us can attest to that, at least to some degree. And so it's obviously that's part of our sinful nature, and it's something that by the power of the Holy Spirit we need to work to crush. And so that is the second category of lust, that uh, vi uh, visual or the more mental, I guess, when you're thinking about people in that kind of way. Then there's a third category of lust, which I think doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but really it gets more to the heart of the issue, and that's what emotional lust. Let me explain what I mean here a little bit. I think I know, at least I, I think I know, that all of us here have, have done this. When you, man, I just, I want, to, I want someone to need me. I want, I want to be loved. I, you know, that deep desire to be wanted and needed. That, in part, I mean, that's, the Lord made us for that. He said it's not good for man to be alone. But when we start using people to fulfill those needs outside of a marriage context, then we can be getting into a level of emotional lust and a level of intimacy, which is inappropriate outside of marriage. Now, I don't want to suggest that we can't have intimate friendships. I mean, I think that's biblical. Look at David and Jonathan. That was an intimate, close friendship. I do believe there is a level of intimacy that is reserved exclusively for marriage between a husband and wife. And so that's why I say this gets a little bit more to the heart of the issue because sex and sexuality and all that physical stuff, it's important, but it's not the main thing. It symbolizes something else. It points to something else. And what it does is it represents that oneness and that intimacy and that unity that's to be shared between a husband and wife. And really, and, I mean, Dad, you did talk about this a little bit, but where I fall down on this is that marriage in its most God-glorifying, God-intended, fulfilled, biblical sense is the best symbol that we have in this life of the Trinity. Because think about it. The three distinct persons of the Godhead sharing one glorious being there's there's a diversity but there's unity there's perfect oneness oneness of purpose oneness of intention there's perfect love sacrificial love fellowship and so with husband and wife it is two distinct persons coming together and becoming one flesh you're no longer two separate lives you're one life united like that and so sex and sexuality that's a picture of that deeper reality of what happens inside that marriage covenant and it points us it directs our eye to God's nature. And so I believe that's a reason why sexual immorality is so serious in God's eyes. Because when we take that gift, that symbol, and we twist it and we use it for our own purposes, what we're doing is defiling and disregarding that picture that God's given us of his tri-personality. 
And that's one reason why this is so serious and such a serious offense to God. And so what it comes down to then is an attitude of intimacy. And I do believe that uh, in Song of Solomon, very concise passage that kind of gets to the point of this, my beloved is mine and I am his. That's something that happens within the covenant of marriage that belonging to someone else. You're no longer your own. You belong to that person. That person belongs to you. You are one life, everything in common. And so when you find yourself in that place where you are so emotionally close to someone else that you're almost sharing that kind of marriage-like intimacy, that's a place that we're not supposed to be if we're not married. Now, once again, I understand we've fallen into some gray area here. How do you know when you're too intimate? How do you know where that is? And, you know, like I said, the Bible doesn't give us a list. I think oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, we know this intrinsically, that we can kind of sense when we're in that place, we're going a little bit too far. I'm too emotionally dependent on this person. I'm too close to this person in that way. I think a lot of the times we do know. What we have to do is go to scriptures and uh, derive some good, solid principles. And so that's what I want to uh, focus on a little bit here excuse me, this afternoon, is some, uh, some principles regarding biblical dating and singleness. Now, I don't want you guys to think that I'm being legalistic up here when I, uh, when I talk about these things. I'm not just telling you guys that what I'm going to be talking about here is, you know, if you don't do these, then you're sinful and you need to repent. I'm not saying that they're authoritative or that they're inerrant. But I do believe that as I've gone through and prepared for this and prayed over this a lot, I do believe that these are biblical and that they're sound principles and they're something that all of us unmarried people should wrestle with and seriously, prayerfully consider. And I'll just be honest with you guys, I have never been more convicted about anything than I was when I was preparing for this. I mean, as I tried to kind of like separate myself from the uh, worldly perspective on dating, because that's like pretty much all I've known, even raised in a Christian household, I've, you know, my idea about dating were, you know, from Full House and other shows like that. <laughs> So I think even um, as I try to separate myself from that and say, okay, what do the scriptures say that dating should look like? I've been very convicted, and I'll be honest with you guys, in this short time, a lot of my ideas about dating have changed. Um, and this is going to be hard. As we go through this, the world is going to push back and pressure us to conform, and we're going to be looked at, you know, those weirdos, what are they doing? I mean, it's, so think about these things, and they may, may sound a little bit radical, but uh, consider them prayerfully. The first one, if we're in a place where we're tempted, we need to get out. Flee tempting situations. Now, this actually is authoritative and biblical because the scriptures do explicitly teach this. Um, Jesus, right after he talks about lusting, being equated to many adultery, what does he say? He says, if your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off. If your eye caused you to sin, tear it out. And so what he's doing there is giving us kind of some graphic imagery of the drastic measures we might have to take to get away from temptation. And so oftentimes this is going to take very dramatic measures. Paul tells us in Romans 13 to make no provision for the flesh. We're told that God doesn't tempt anyone, and we're told that he also provides with us, for us a way of escape from every temptation. And so we don't intentionally put ourselves in a situation we're going to be, where we're going to be tempted. And if we find ourselves in a tempting situation, we are to get out of there. Our job, our responsibility as Christians is to pray for that way of escape and to take it when God reveals it to us because he promises he always does. If we find ourselves in a tempting situation, we can know that that is not from God. We need to get out of there. In the, in the Lord's Prayer, we say what? Lead us not into temptation. We're praying that the Lord keeps us from temptation. So how hypocritical is it if we go on and intentionally put ourselves in a position where we know there's going to be temptation? You know, you're sitting there, I don't know, laying in bed next to your boyfriend or girlfriend and praying, Lord, please keep me from temptation. I mean, I'm, yeah, <laughs> what are you doing there? That's, can you see the hypocrisy in that? If we're praying for the Lord to keep us from temptation and yet we're willingly going into it. I think we can see a great example from this in scripture between two uh, big time Old Testament characters, Joseph and David. Um, both of them were faced with, strong sexual temptations, and they responded completely differently. Joseph, you guys know the story, was sold into slavery by his brothers, rose, became the head of this uh, powerful guy, Potiphar's house, 
and his wife, Potiphar's wife, kept pursuing David, and she wanted to get with him. And in Genesis 39, 12, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. So he, like, you know, literally ran away when faced with that tempting situation. And what does David do in 2 Samuel 11? It happened late one afternoon. David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. That he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful, and David sent and inquired about the woman. So was it sinful in and of itself for David to, you know, the actual act of inquiring about her? Well, not by itself, but as an act of enticing temptation and acting on a lust. David, what he does there, he doesn't, what, look away? He doesn't go back inside? No. He looks, he acknowledges her beauty, and he asks about her. And, of course, we know where that led to. And so just look at that difference between what they did when they're faced with temptation. So don't ever trust yourself. I think that's one of the big problems with us is that we tend to trust ourselves too much. We think, oh, that's not going to happen to me. I'm solid. Listen, I don't care how long you've been a Christian. If a guy like David could fall into that kind of sin or if... um. If a guy like David could fall into that kind of sin, or, you know, you hear about all the time these pastors or, like, lifelong Christians, guys who end up in sexual immorality deep in there, if they can fall into it, then there is nothing stopping. I don't care how long you've been a Christian for. I don't care how committed you are to obedience, how committed you and your Christian partner are to being obedient. Those temptations are strong. Paul tells Timothy to flee youthful passions. He doesn't tell him to stay there and fight against them and try to resist them. No, he says to run away from those things. These are strong temptations. And so when we find ourselves in the midst of that, we need to get out of there because it's so easy for us to start crossing those lines and to start sliding into sin. We take little steps toward it. It's not like all of a sudden we jump off a cliff and we're in deep sin. It's these little steps. And so when we're in those tempting situations, we need to get out. And one of the ways to do that, don't be alone together. This is one that I changed on. I flipped on this. I thought this might have been a little bit too much, but analyzing it from Scripture, listen, I understand that it's important in a dating relationship as you're getting to know someone, you want to, that to have, a lot of that happens one-on-one. And I get that. And so I don't want to go, personally, I'm not going to take this so far as to say that you need to be chaperoned everywhere you go. I think it's okay to go out on dates in public places. You know, you go out to dinner, you go bowling or something, but don't be like alone, alone in the apartment or in the bedroom or in the house by yourself or something like that. It's just too easy, and those temptations are going to be there. Like I said, I don't care who you are, you're going to be tempted in that way, and uh, just spending that time alone together only perpetuates that. So watch out for that. And this can even happen, I don't know, in the car or like when you're walking her to the door and stuff like that. You need to be cognizant of this all the time and constantly on guard. And if you find yourself being overly tempted in those kinds of situations, even if it is just driving in the car or something like that, or if you find yourself in those situations lusting, then you need to act and you do need to put an end to that. Now, You want to talk to your partner about it. You want to let them know where you're at. And if they're a godly, biblical individual, then they should understand and work forward with you on that. But I don't think there's a lot of room for moving around here. Like I said, where there's temptation, we get out. And part of that is not spending time alone together where, you know, there's no accountability. Spend time with other people where you can be accountable. I think that's also important. The next one is another tough one that's always going to come up. What about physical affection? What about, you know, what about kissing and hugging and things like that? Is that okay? (laughs) Once again, this is one where people are going to land in a lot of different places on this. You're going to find some Christians who say, no, none of that's allowed. You know, you, no hugging, no kissing, none of that. And I think that's a valid conviction that you need to respect. I don't think I come down necessarily, my mom's making a face at me. (laughs) I don't think I come down necessarily. I think that there can be some affection in a premarital relationship that can be appropriate, but very limited. And once again, I, you know, I may be walking the razor's edge on this one because I don't want to go all out and say none whatsoever. We need to be, once again, very careful and always examining ourselves. What are your intentions? 
are you fulfilling a lust? What are you getting out of this? What's the purpose of this? I think holding hands, you know, kiss goodnight, things like that, not necessarily a problem. Obviously, there's affection when you're, you know, making out, when you're sitting on each other's lap. I think when you're, I don't know, laying in the same bed together, I do think that stuff goes too far, both physically and as far as the emotional lust that we talked about, that intimacy. I think those things take it a little bit too far. But I do believe that there can be some level of physical affection limited that can be appropriate. But once again, we need to be very cognizant of where we are. We need to be very prayerful in examining ourselves. And as soon as we, you're going to see as we go forward, uh, I think the next one. But um, as we continue to examine ourselves, if we find that we're fulfilling lust, that we're gratifying our desires of the flesh, then it needs to stop. And don't, like I said, these could be drastic measures. And you could have been in a relationship for years with somebody and realize that you're lusting after them in these ways, and you might have to end some of this stuff that you're doing. These things aren't going to be easy. If, you're, if we're committed to living consistently, biblically, and fleeing from sexual morality, it's going to be tough in a lot of areas. And I want to say something, especially to um, any men. I don't know how many single, unmarried men we have here. Listen. Not only are you responsible for your own lusts, but you share responsibility in your girlfriend lusting after you. As the head of the relationship, the God-ordained head, our job is to respect and protect our girlfriends, and part of that is doing everything we can to keep them from sin. And so you may be in a situation where you're fine, you're not lusting, you're okay, but if you can tell that she's lusting after you, you need to put an end to that. Don't wait till she says that it's a problem. You put an end to it as the man, as the head, looking out for her best interests and yours. What did Christ do? He presented that church uh, spotless and without wrinkle. And so our jobs are doing everything we can to keep uh, our girlfriends from sin. So just consider that. Now, obviously, women, you're going to answer for your lusts too, of course. But Men, we share in the responsibility. We do. And so you need to be aware of that. If You could be okay, but if she's not, you need to put an end to it. You take the responsibility there. The next one, don't date until you're firm in your faith. And I think I want to be really hard on this one because so much of these other things flow from this. If we're not firm in our faith, then we're not going to abide by any of, these, any of these other principles probably. First of all, it's really easy when you get into a relationship, your interests become suddenly divided, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But you know, if you're in a relationship, if you're married, or if you're dating somebody, or if you have dated somebody, you know that that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy and attention. And uh, sometimes that can take your eyes off Christ, and that can't happen. Like what my dad was saying about marriage, Christ needs to be at the center of the relationship. And so if, you're, if Christ isn't the center of your life before you start dating someone, then he's probably not going to become the center of your life after you start dating them. If anything, your relationship with the Lord is going to suffer. And so you want to make sure that you're already on firm standing with God and in your relationship to Christ before you enter into that kind of romantic relationship. Now, of course, I want to keep qualifying these things. I'm not saying you need to you know, be a theologian or a scholar. You had to have been a Christian for 20 years before you can date someone. But you need to obviously be sure that you're saved of your own faith. You need to understand the gospel. I think you need to have a pretty firm grasp on what the Lord expects out of his people, on what godly obedience consists of. And you need to be devoted to serving him before anything else. Otherwise, the relationship um, with your partner is going to suffer and your relationship with the Lord will suffer. You need to be firm. And like I said, if you're not firm, then you're probably not going to abide by these other things because obedience isn't going to be that important to you. Like I mentioned earlier, if these lifelong, powerful, you know, strong, solid Christians can fall into sexual immorality, then how much more careful do young Christians need to be? And so if you're a new Christian, if you're young in the faith, don't even like, start to approach those tempting situations. You need to get firm in the Lord first and then seek a partner. I think that's key. And the last uh, principle for dating we have, don't date casually. Another, another place where the culture has completely taken over in the realm of dating is right here in this. 
And I don't know where the world gets this from. This is like, relatively speaking, in terms of history, a pretty new idea as far as casual dating goes. I mean, without, within the past, what, you know, century, two centuries? I mean, if that, if that, yeah. Um, and really, it's a consumeristic attitude. And what it kind of does is it will liken dating to something like car shopping, where you need to, what? go out there, you want to test drive a bunch of different models, it's a pretty big commitment when you, when you buy a car, so you want to you know, make sure you know what you like, you know what you don't like, you know, weigh your decision carefully, and then finally you, know, you make your decision, you settle on one. And so what are, what's the world tell us about dating? It says that we need to go out and we need to play the field, right? We need to you know, see what's out there, because how do you really know what you like unless you've experienced a lot of different kinds of people? You know, you need to know who you click with and who you clash with. You need to know all these things before. And then maybe eventually you can settle on someone, but, you know, not before you've gone through five, seven, ten relationships. Then you can finally kind of have a better idea of what you want, what's good for you. We're told that you need to kind of experience heartbreak, or at least there's this attitude that, like, if you haven't gone through heartbreak, then you don't really understand, you know, really what it is to be in a relationship. You need that experience. I don't know where this comes from, by the way. This is completely from the world. And all it does, it keeps us, it gives us all the benefits of being in a relationship without any of the commitment. And that's what all this is designed to do, is to keep us from commitment. And so what, instead of in the past, you know, not even too long ago, where you, know, you had, okay, you're going steady, you're engaged, and you're married. Now what? We have you're, you're texting first, or Snapchatting, and then you're talking, kind of like thinking about it, and then you're seeing each other casually, and then you're finally Facebook official in a relationship, and then you move in together, and then a few years later you get engaged, and then you have a kid, and then you get married, but you still have a prenup in case you want to get out of there. So we've added all these layers to keep ourselves from commitment we want all the benefits of being in a relationship without any of the commitment. We want to leave ourselves an escape. And so that's exact and so the casual dating is designed for that. To leave us an escape. We don't need to commit. But you shouldn't be surprised to hear that the biblical idea of dating is pretty much the opposite of that. Listen, we talked about how um, how important romance and sexuality and intimacy are to the Lord, how important that is, that should be to Christians, and how the only proper context for those things is within marriage. And so if you're not dating with a serious attitude and intention for marriage, then what are you doing? You have no business dating that person. Like I said, this might sound a little bit, I mean, I know I heard this, like my parents did tell me this growing up, but I ignored them. And, but it's so true. Listen, there is no place for dating. There's no place for that kind of romance unless you intend on marrying that person. Now, once again, I'm not saying you need to be ready to propose on the first date, but you need to have seriously thought about it. You need to, have, you need to know this person and know that, you know, yes, I could spend the rest of my life with this person and I intend to, you're actually planning on marrying the person you date. You shouldn't plan to date like, you know, five different people. The first person you date, you should plan to marry that person. Otherwise, what are you doing? There's no reason to date someone if you don't plan to marry them. I'm sorry if that's hard to hear, but it's true. I mean, it's hard for me to say. It is. Um, and I'll tell you, the only other option is that you're fulfilling a lust, whether it's physical or emotional whether it's you know, using that person to gratify some sexual desire or using them because you crave that level of companionship, you crave that sort of romance. Those are the only other options. Or you're actually intending to marry that person. Now, is it sinful then to break up with someone, to date someone and then break up, to not marry the first person you date? Well, of course not. But it's not ideal. That shouldn't be what we're aiming for. That's not par for the course. Like I said, our intention should be to marry the person who we're dating. There's nothing casual about that realm of romance and you know, growing in closeness to another person. And so we can't have a casual attitude about it. And so if we have this serious attitude towards dating, then we want to be pretty sure about someone before we enter into the relationship. 
And so what do we want to think about? What do we want to look for in a potential partner? So specifically to those of you who are single here, what do we look for for a partner? Well, I'm going to drop something pretty big on you guys. It's not about looks. Even the world acknowledges this. This is something that, you know, obviously. But what are the things that the world values? Personality? Well, it goes deeper than that. Compatibility? Important, but deeper than that. Those things are secondary, way secondary. I didn't know exactly what my dad was going to go with his presentation, but it actually works pretty well with this. Um, first of all, they have to be a Christian. That should go without saying, but clearly it doesn't. And so let me just say a few words on this. And Dad, you did mention this, but don't even consider dating someone if they're not a Christian. And this is, this can be very difficult because we can very genuinely fall in love with someone who is not a Christian. And when, that kind of, when those kinds of emotions are in play, I mean, we know how strong our hearts can be, how powerful that emotion can be. And so what do we do? We'll start to think of all kinds of excuses or reasons. Um, this is explicit in Scripture, by the way, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? If we fall in love with someone who's not a Christian or we meet someone and we really hit it off with them and we think that you know, we, should, we want to get together with them and they could be good for us, then we'll start to think of all kinds of excuses to date that person, even though the scripture says explicitly not to. We'll say that, you know, well, you know what? Maybe if I start dating them, they get close with me, we spend time together, the Lord will use that and he'll change their hearts and they'll become a Christian and everything will be perfect. Well, the Lord might do that but he's not obligated to do that. Don't just assume that the Lord is going to change somebody's heart. Like I said, he could, but that's not our attitude. We're not told to you know, date whoever we want and the Lord could change their hearts. Or don't go into it saying, well, you know what? I'll date this person for a year or for two years, and if the Lord still hasn't changed them, then I'll break up with them and move on to someone else. That's, like I said, you need to plan on marrying someone before you're dating them, so that fails right away. Don't assume that God is going to change their hearts. What's going to end up happening? A Christian being in a relationship with a non-Christian, that's not God putting some sort of restrictions on us to keep us from being happy. That is totally for our good because these relationships can only end poorly. What will happen if the relationship is going to work is that you, the Christian, are going to have to compromise your faith a lot. Why? Why? Well, if you're consistently living out your Christian faith, if you're living for the Lord, and I mean really committed to Christ, to the Christian life, if your unbelieving partner's heart isn't softened and changed, their heart's going to be hardened and they'll just leave. I mean, they'll get out of there. And so if you want to make the relationship work, then you're going to be the one who has to start making sacrifices. You're going to have to, you know, put a little off there, not be so hard-lined on that, don't talk about that. Maybe only go to church a few times. Maybe you, know, you start making little sacrifices along the line and your relationship with Christ suffers. Why? So your relationship with an unbeliever can maybe flourish somewhat. So don't even consider it. And don't even entertain the ideas in your mind. If you feel yourself starting to fall for somebody who's an unbeliever, if you're starting to get interested, don't even play it out or entertain it. Just put that away. Pray that the Lord would take those thoughts and those feelings away. And if the Lord pleases to, and he wants to change that person's heart, and he does, and after that you want to get together with that person, go ahead. But unless or until that happens, no, don't date somebody who's not a Christian. So beyond that then, what should we be looking for in a partner? Once they meet that prerequisite, we want them to have a basic understanding of the biblical rules of male and female. And so we just had a long discussion on that, those passions, that passages from Ephesians and 1 Peter. I'm not going to go all the way back into those. And so clearly, that's a pretty high standard. We're not looking for somebody who you know, meets that standard perfectly, of course. But you want somebody who shows those tendencies, somebody who they have at least an understanding and they tend toward those things. So if he's a man, does he take responsibility? Is he eager to lead? Does he serve other people in his life? Does he show those sorts of qualities? And for women, do they... Are they willing to submit? Are they kind of repulsed by the idea of submission like so many are? 
are they, I keep looking at my mom, <laughs> making me laugh. Um, yes, are they willing to submit? Uh, are they willing to be led? Are they eager to learn and to be led? What you want to really look for then is a trajectory. Are they on, the, on that path toward, uh, toward fulfilling those roles? Do they understand where they fall short? Or do they think that, oh, you know, I'm fine, I'm good, I got this figured out? And where they do fall short, are they concerned about it? Or do they just say, hey, that's just who I am, I'm not going to change, it is what it is? Are they concerned with, uh, with growing in the Lord? I think it's also important to um, consider their prayer and their devotional life. Like I said, you want to get to know these people well. You don't want to date someone you just met a few weeks ago. You need to know somebody well before you start dating them. So consider, are they committed to their relationship with the Lord? Are they deep in their faith? Do they spend time in the Word? Do they spend time in prayer? Do they go to church? What's their attitude toward that? Go to church with them. You know, uh, Do those kinds of things together. Read the Word with them before you start dating, before you get into that relationship. Establish that your relationship first in the Lord and then take it to the next level as far as romance and that sort of thing goes. Um, as I mentioned, you want to make sure, are they, uh, like I said, that trajectory of sanctification, are they concerned about personal holiness? Are they concerned with growing in their obedience to the Lord? Basically, you can summarize this. Are they a real, true, solid Christian? You want to look for somebody who is firm and deep in their faith and someone who's committed, not someone who's just, you know, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian and just kind of a, pretty loosely using that term of being a Christian, and they're not really serious about their faith. You want to look for somebody who is very serious about it and who you can grow with in the Lord. I think there are other things to consider that kind of fall secondary. Um, you can think about, like, doctrinal standings. I'm not saying this necessarily is make or break, but, you know, you want to talk about, you know, are they, do they believe in infant baptism or are they believers only baptism? Because that's, a, that's something that you're going to have to face down the line if you get married to that person and have kids. It's something to think about. You know, I'm not saying that an Arminian can't date a Calvinist, but it's something to consider. It's definitely worth looking into. Not that those have to be deal breakers. I think also another important thing that you might want to do and don't think that like personality and compatibility don't play a part in this at all. I mean, they do. I'm not saying that like if you find somebody who's a good, solid Christian and you get along and they're eligible, then you have to date that person or there's something wrong with you. I mean, if you don't get along with them too well, or if, you're not, if you don't mesh with them, then that's perfectly okay to not be with them. But those things, you know, whether you like the same kind of food or movies or activities or whatever, I mean, those things are absolutely secondary. First, they have to be a solid Christian, and then... After that are all the regular things we think about and put on our dating profiles, if you've ever done that. <laughs> I think you also want to, as far as much as you can, if possible, get to know their family and get to know their church family. Spend that sort of time with them. Like I said, all this before you start dating them. I think for so many of us, we consider, we have that kind of worldly idea of casual dating, where first you start dating, and then as you move forward in the relationship, then you get to know their family, and you get to know their friends, and you get to know their, uh, their relationship to the Lord better. But I think the more biblical idea of this is to do that stuff first. Because like I said, you need to be seriously considering marrying that person before you date them. And so you should, again, I know it's not always possible, but you should try to get to know their families, get to know their church, get to know them more deeply. And I think an important thing, too, oftentimes, you know, if we're thinking about dating somebody, we'll pray about that. That's good. We should do that. But I think it would be a good idea to talk to that person whom you're considering and pray with them about it. Approach that person and say, you know, I'm, you know I believe that you know, this may be something that I'm interested in or some place where the Lord is leading me to this kind of relationship with you and you talk to them and you pray about it together I think that's kind of like a I mean can you imagine like a more firm solid ground to begin a relationship you know so we're not looking for that you know just kind of casually date around see what you like but know them first and know them in the Lord first I feel like I've gone way shorter than than I planned we have a little bit more okay perfect so here we are then, and those of us who 
came in here unmarried are still unmarried and we're you know we have these principles and we're going to be going out and we're still looking and praying for a partner and we're you know uh, looking for someone to date and maybe we'll use these principles when that happens but what then in the meantime is our view on singleness and if you guys still have your bibles open to first corinthians just flip the page or you might not even have to uh, to first corinthians 7 where paul talks about the unmarried and there's you know, a few places in the Bible that we can go to talk about singleness, but this is a really good passage, and we're not going to obviously hit on every single point he makes because he says a lot. But just uh, read along here. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 25 through 38. And here's what Paul writes. Now concerning the, bet- the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn live as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as though they had no goods, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes and let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity but having his desire under control, and has determined that in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries does well, but he who refrains from marriage will do even better. All right, so like I said, a lot there. not going to go into everything he says. But I think at first reading of that passage, we can start to, like, taken aback a little bit as unmarried and people are like, wait a minute, is Paul like against marriage? I mean, I thought, as we talked about this morning, marriage is given by God. It's a gift. It's a good thing. Man is not meant to be alone. Isn't marriage something good that we should be after? No, Paul's not contradicting those truths. And that is true. Marriage is a very good thing and a gift ordained by God. He's making two big points here. One of them is not to be too concerned with or attached to the things of the world. He says the present form of this world is passing away. And so when he's talking about all that, you know, though that, uh, those who have wives, though they had no wives, and so on like that, what he's saying is that we understand as Christians that this world is not our home. This isn't all that there is. Our primary concern is beyond this world. And so as we're seeking and searching after a wife and, or a spouse and praying for those things, that is not our primary pursuit, and we understand that. And so we're not going to be too attached to those things or too overly concerned with that because we know that this life is transient, that we're just passing through here. And secondly, he's saying that being in Christ is more fulfilling than any relationship, including marriage, that our undivided devotion is to be toward the Lord, that he fulfills those needs so it's not as if we're incomplete apart from a spouse. I think there's like this idea, at least an idea that I've heard and that I've heard said, I don't know if you, any of you guys have heard this, but that there's only a certain specific kind of person who's kind of given that gift of being able to be single and being able to handle it, that they, you know, they go through life and they never really want to get married and they're totally content being by themselves. And to a degree, I think that's true. There are some people like that. But the reality is that all of us, as all of us who are unmarried, have been equipped and given those gifts to handle it for this season in our lives, however long that season might be. And so what we should be doing then is leaning into the Lord and being completely fulfilled by Christ. He's sufficient for us. So our attitude needs to be one that is, as I, as I said, being fulfilled in Him 
And listen, it's not sinful to desire a spouse or to pursue a spouse, even to earnestly desire somebody. That is not a sinful desire. I think that is a godly desire. The problem, though, is when that becomes our main pursuit, when that becomes the big focus in our lives, when we, when we kind of set that above everything else, and then we start to make compromises, and we start to you know, leave God's word behind, and we start to kind of find someone on our own terms, our own way, the world's way. That's what we need to be careful of, and I think that is part of what Paul's warning against here, is not to stray from the... Uh, from scripture in favor of finding something that only belongs in this world. If that makes any sense. So don't be, don't become too desperate. You know, don't, and don't start to put deadlines on God saying, okay, well, you know, I'll, if I'm not in a serious relationship by the time I'm 30 or 35, then, you know, I'm just going to kind of do it my own way. Because that will be a temptation. We may get tired of waiting. And it can be hard. And like I said, I'm you know, convicted by these things that I'm saying. You know, this, these are things that I need to work on personally in my own life, being completely fulfilled by the Lord. And then also, we don't want to be worried too much about being alone, about remaining single. Because as I said, Christ is the one who fills our hearts. He's the one that fulfills all those needs. You know, if you're pinning, I think, again, I keep alluding back to my dad's piece, but if you're pinning your happiness on another person and you're looking to your spouse or to your potential spouse as being the one who's going to fulfill all these desires and, you know, once I'm with that person, then I can move forward in my life and, you know, things are going to be different, then you're going to be really let down. That's not what our attitude is. We need to be fully sufficed by Christ first. I didn't mean to rhyme that. Um, we need to be sufficed by him first before and be completely satisfied in him. And so if it is the Lord's desire that we should remain single for the rest of our lives, then we need to joyfully embrace that. And like I said, that's something that's even hard for me to say, but it's true. We need to be okay with that if the Lord, if that's what the Lord has for us. And that's something that we only get by really praying that the Lord would give us that sort of spirit. And so pray for contentment in the situation that you're in. Wait patiently for the Lord. Wait for his will to be done. Don't try to force something, but wait for him to bring that person into your life if he wills to do so. Paul says at the very end of this passage something very interesting. He said the married person does well, but the one who refrains from marriage will do even better. So that's a little bit interesting to say. Now, he's not saying that being single is somehow more virtuous or that God prefers unmarried people to married people. What he's saying is that as unmarried people, we have the privilege and the responsibility to pour ourselves more fully into the Lord. And so in that sense, singleness is something to rejoice in because we're more free and more able to serve the church more directly, to serve God's people, to be more intimately involved in whatever ministry that the Lord has put us in. And that's a responsibility. And we can grow deeper and deeper in our relationship with the Lord. Paul says it very plainly. The married person's interests are divided. We, and to allude back to what I said, this is why we have to be firm in our faith before we start dating someone because it's going to divide our interests. So we need to be solid in the Lord first. But the married person, his interests are divided. And so he's not going to have, just naturally, you have other commitments and other priorities in your life. And yes, when you're married, your spouse becomes a very legitimate priority. I mean, that your primary vocation when you get married is to love and serve your spouse the way the Lord has called you to do. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. And so as unmarried people, we get to be in the Word. We get to pour ourselves into that relationship more than a relationship with somebody else. It is a privilege. It's a good thing. In the season of your life that the Lord has called you to singleness, it is a very good thing. And so my challenge to you guys who are unmarried and to myself is don't be so concerned with you know, looking for someone and finding someone. But instead, use this time to really grow deep in your faith, deeper, 
get drawn near to the Lord. Get more deeply involved in your church, serving the people of your church, serving the people, uh, other believers that are in your life. Like I said, fulfilling the ministry that the Lord has given to you. He's called every one of his people. He's given us all opportunities to minister. Pour yourself into that as an unmarried person and continue to do work and service on behalf of the kingdom of God. That be, That is... It's not an option for the unmarried Christian. That's the responsibility. We are to pour ourselves into the lives of other Christians and into Christ and into his church. And so in that, we ought to rejoice in singleness because that too, like marriage, is a gift from God for his glory and for our good. I'm going to pray real quick and then we'll have time for questions. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the great privilege of uh, having this time together of fellowship and of learning and as I mentioned before it is such a worthy cause to uh, talk about and learn about your institution of marriage which is a very good thing and a great gift from you and also Lord that gift that you've given of singleness to the unmarried Lord and it's important to address that as well and so I thank you for the opportunity that we've had to address that here this morning and Lord I pray that as we go forth from this place we wouldn't just forget about these things and go on with our lives, but Lord, that we would be convicted where that conviction was necessary, Lord, and really what it comes down to, whether we're married or unmarried, is having Christ Jesus as the center of our lives, Lord God, and so I pray that each one of us as we leave here today is more committed to our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his centrality in our lives. I thank you so much, Lord, that you have given us a Savior who fulfills our deepest desires, who fulfills our need for companionship, for love. Lord, all things, all of us find our greatest joy in Christ Jesus. And so I thank you primarily for him, Lord. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. All right. Um, oh, how much time do we have left for uh, questions? What, half an hour, about? So any of you guys have any we don't have to use the full half hour but we have time um any questions or comments at all Yeah, I think that's that's everything that we really want to talk about today is that centrality of Christ. That's big. Yeah, yeah, it is so true. She's uh, saying. We want to repeat it for the uh, camera because they can't hear them. But she's uh, commenting on the uh, the casual dating. And it's so true. And there's so much pressure from the world to just kind of date casually. I mean, because that is the expectation. And so you're looked at as strange. And so I think in all these things, there's great pressure to conform. And same with uh, in marriage. And like we're talking about with the gender roles and the submission and the headship. Those things are so much pressure from the world to conform. And so as you said, Marriage and singleness are always going to be counterculture from a Christian perspective. Even back in the day, a lot of the Christian camps, and you know, we would send our kids to those camps. A lot of the uh, behind some of that was this intention of perhaps meeting your your future spouse in that context. Uh, it's one of the things that's changed within the church and the Christian scene is those kinds of things, those groups, those youth groups, they're becoming like fertile ground just for the casual kind of dating that's out there. So it's just another area to beware. Again, in the past, there's there's kind of those expectations, somewhat as you're growing in the Lord, but also as as you're coming together and, and coming of age, there's the, the idea of the future spouse, dating with that purpose or that goal. It's not much like that even in the Christian context today. So we need to be careful on that. And um, I think just going off of that, it's something that's important for us to be conscientious of in our churches is uh, cultivating, where there's opportunity, cultivating relationships between young people within the church and kind of under the, I don't want to say like under the eye, but yeah, under the auspice of the, of the church so that they remain accountable in that regard and you're not just kind of off 
in the world doing it the world's way. Uh, yeah, Eve. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah, and she said that uh, the world's telling us to conform, but clearly the world's way isn't working, and I think we do see that. I mean, as he's talked about with marriage. But it's also like the path of least resistance, and the world has an appeal to our sinful nature. That's, that's a big deal. That's what we're struggling against. That's one of the big things about this whole conference or the seminar today, a lot of basic things. We've been saying this. It's not much that you don't know. It's what are you doing with that knowledge that we have? Are we really pressing into Christ with these things? Are we really leaning to him? Because it's so easy to do what the world's doing. And we're bent that way. Even as Christians, we still face those temptations. We're praying for that will. And it, in that sense, as we think about Scripture and as Christians, it taking God's order, God's structure, God's normal way of working, it's very appropriate. Laura and I have prayed that way for our kids. I get choked up. <laughs> yeah. Since yeah. before they were born. And I think that just in general, you know, we never know God's unrevealed will, but it is never wrong to pray for those things that God reveals in Scripture to be good things like marriage for our children or grandchildren or, you know, even things like, you know, healing from diseases. You know, it could be God's will that somebody does not get healed from something, but that doesn't mean that we don't pray for it. It's always okay to pray for those things that are good. Yeah, that's a big deal, especially in the past in churches. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's not at all. Yeah, and if, like you said, you're, that's a wonderful flip side to that because that's kind of the you know normal expectation they grow to get married. And there's a tendency sometimes to look down on the singles in our congregation. Well, we got to get you a spouse. We, no, as Luke was saying, we need to pray for you where you're at. If that's the Lord's will, if that's his intention, your intention. But right now, here's where you're at. Take that opportunity. I've told Luke this in different contexts. Um, when he has a full-time job for UPS now, but before this, he wasn't working as much. It was more part-time. I would tell them specifically, take this time now to draw near to the Lord because once you get that job, it's going to be tougher. You're going to have to make more time. So it's that kind of principle as well. But our singles, the singles in the church, it's just so valuable, devoted to Christ. You hear what Paul said? And I think the church in the past has not done a great job with that. You've, kind of, you've almost treated our singles like second-class citizens. No way. No way. We're one in Christ, and there's honor in that as well. So absolutely for that. Any other uh, questions or remarks? All right. Hey, well, I want to thank you guys so much for taking these hours to come out. I know it's a Saturday. It's a tough thing to do. There's a lot going on. It's a beautiful day. So we just want to thank you so much for spending this part of the day with us and just pray that the Lord will use these things uh, that he brought us today to, to strengthen our lives in Jesus Christ, our married lives and our single lives. So thank you once again for, for coming out and hanging out. I think we have some cookies and chips. Clear that out. Take that with you. And again, thank you so much. God bless you. And um, also one final thing. If you guys